Golden Age Radio is starting now. Subscribe to get future updates. Saddle up and hang on to your 10-gallon hat. Get ready to ride off into the sunset with pistols a blazing for this exciting lineup. Starting with the Lone Ranger, Gunsmoke, Have Gun Will Travel, Wild Bill, and then the Texas Rangers. Followed by Dragnet, Calling All Cars, Richard Diamond, Secrets of Scotland Yard, and Black Museum. A fiery horse with the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty high old silver, the Lone Ranger. rich grasslands of Texas brought wealth and prosperity to many early settlers. But when the days of the open range passed, disputes arose over boundaries and water rights, with a cattle war the inevitable result. The vast crowd of the plains fought this means of settling a dispute just as bitterly as he fought the outlaws and cattle rustlers who roamed the new territory. It was he, more than any other man, who brought law and order to the frontier. And now return with us to those thrilling days when the West was young. An adventure lay at the end of every trail. The Lone Ranger rides again. Come on, Silver! We're heading for the range country! Hail Silver! The sheriff and one of his deputies rode out from town toward the Halstead branch. As they approached the trail that led to the ranch house, they sighted two horsemen coming toward them. The sheriff and the deputy reined in their horses and held their rifles ready for action. Oh, oh there. Oh, oh, there. Looks like one of them two's an Indian. So he is, sheriff. The one riding the paint horse. Yeah. And get a look at the other man. He's wearing a mask. By thunderation, Halstead's doing just what he promised me he wouldn't. Bringing in outside gunmen, huh? Just so. Hey there, you. Hold up there. Rain up. We aim to question you. Oh, 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 oh. Stand where you are. Don't move. Wearing a mask, eh? You're the sheriff around here, aren't you? That's what I am. Well, what are you blocking this trail for? We hanker to ask a few questions. Why are you heading for the Halstead Ranch? Well, I didn't know I was heading there. Is that where this trail goes? Just so. But it goes beyond the Halstead Ranch, doesn't it? Yes. That's where I'm going. I'm heading for the west. What's the idea of the mask? Because I want to hide my face. Why do you block the trails to the Halsteads? What's the matter there? You a professional gunslinger? No. Them six guns you're wearing look capable. And so they are. 
Tell me why this trail is closed. I want to go ahead. Well, you ain't going to. Savvy? If I wasn't so busy trying to keep some law and order with a range war going on, I'd run you in for wearing a mask and find out something about you. Range war? Yep, range war. There's a regular feud going on. That's why I'm stopping you and turning you back. Now swing your horses around and head back the way you come. If you want to get beyond the Halstead Ranch, take the trail to the south and go around it. Tell me more about this feud. Who's having trouble with Halstead? Bart Conway and his outfit. Glad that the whole region's tore up with a feuding of them, too. I got my men posted on the trail to keep strangers from going through and getting shot up. And also to keep both Halstead and Conway from important gun toters to make it a worse war than it is. Well, what started the war? Same thing as always starts some water rights. There's plenty of water around this part of the country? That's what we always figured. But it seems that Halstead dammed up one of the main streams and diverted water from Conway's place to his own. I've heard of Bart Conway. He has a good many thousand acres. And so's Halstead. Two of the biggest ranches around here, and they join each other. Now there's the Dickens to pay. What are you wasting time argufying with him for, Sheriff? Tell him to get, and if you don't get, start blazing. Mind your own business, Deputy. When a man speaks civil to me, I speak civil to him. I want to see Halstead. For what? Bart Conway's on the level. And so's Halstead. That's what I want to find out. You better turn and get now, stranger. Sheriff, we're going on to Halstead's ranch. By thunderation, you ain't. You said the reason you wanted us to turn back was to prevent our being shot by one of the fighters. And that's just so. Then what are you going to do if we push on past you? Shoot us? You've been told to turn and get. Now, stranger, don't get me riled. You I... shoot us and do the very thing you're trying to prevent others from doing? Or would you let us go and take our chance at being shot? Dad, right it. you ain't supposed to argue with me. You're supposed on, to... Get on, get on. Hey, they're coming past us. Stop. Stop where you are. Let's drill them. Come on, stop. Hold on, on Groucho, Deputy. Don't shoot. But he's gone past. He's heading for Halstead's. Well, what are we going to do about it? The critter's right after all. Better to let him take his chances being drilled by one of Conway's or Halstead's men than for us to drill him. He might come through alive in spite of all the leads that's flying. <laughs> Never yet was a range war that settled anything, Tonto. Not right. And in many cases, range wars have been started by people who sit back and watch two fine men break each other so they can step in when both sides are weakened. You think maybe that happened? If Halstead is as fine a man as Conway, then this feud has got to stop. How you stop it? Before we consider that, we'll try and learn more about Bill Halstead. Come on, Silver! In a cafe a few miles from the scene of the range war, we find two men seated at a table. I did my best to pour lead into the two of them, Pete, but the sheriff wouldn't let me. How long ago was it that they got through to Halstead's place? Oh, it must have been five, six hours, middle of the afternoon. They went right on past Halstead's and kept going, and it's all right. They'd be past the far end of his ranch by this time. I thought maybe you could change the plans for tonight. Can't do that. I promised delivery on the cattle. I savvy. And the men that are paying the cash will meet you at the far side of the ranch to pay it and take the critters, huh? Just so. I sure got to hand it to you, Pete. You worked the thing right smart. What's the sheriff think of the few? <laughs> He's downright <laughs> disgusted with it. Says the shame two men like the Halstead-Conway pair has to shoot each other up. The war's progressing in good shape, ain't it? I should say it is. Men from both outfits are kept too busy with fighting to pay any attention to branding and line riding and things of that sort. <laughs> sure. Good enough. Now, you do all you can to keep me posted on things. Well, I can do that all right, Pete. Yeah. Being a deputy, I get to hear all the news. Yeah. See that you pass it on to me pronto. Ain't I done that so far? Well, keep on doing it. Now I gotta leave you. I'll meet you here tomorrow and have some cash for you. Good. It'll be right handy. Hey there, deputy. Yeah? I want to speak to you a minute. Step closer. If it's about what I owe you, I... Uh... Yeah, about nothing else. You just bought four more drinks you ain't paid for. I told your waiter to charge them. Trouble is, deputy, the book I write the charge accounts in is just about plumb filled up on your page. You'll get your money. When? Tomorrow. How's that? 
You don't get a payday till the first of the month. I said you'd get your cash tomorrow. Hey, what's the matter here? Oh, evening, Pete. Barkeep, was you asking the deputy for cash? Yes, I was. Well, here. Does that square the account? Well, Pete, I don't want to take your money. I says, does that square the account? Sure. You got some change coming. Yeah, keep it in case my friend, the deputy, wants a little more credit. Thanks, Pete. I'll pay you as soon as no, I... will collect. I ain't worried. Now. Well, you're square with the board again, deputy. But you hadn't better let the sheriff hear that you're letting an hombre like Pete pay your debts for you. I well, didn't ask him to. It's so far peculiar that he'd do that. I just don't savvy it. Pete ain't given to being a generous critter. Well, it ain't none of your affair. You've got your cash, and if you don't like where it come from, I'll tell Pete to take his business to the other cafe. Hmm. It might suit me fine. Fool, peller name huh? Pete. Huh? Or say, Injun, we ain't allowed to serve no liquor to Redskins. Not all right. Me see Pete Peller with Blowman. Yeah? Fool, peller name Pete. Injun, all I can tell you is just this. The less you have to do with him, the better. Especially now when the range wars are, and dead men are found most every day. Oh. You savvy that? Pete don't like Injuns. And he especially don't like engines that are curious about him. Uh, me, Sammy. Tonto left the cafe shortly after Pete and followed him. Meanwhile, the Lone Ranger crept past Halstead's guards and finally reached Big Bill's ranch house. How did you get here? How Take did it you easy, get Halstead. Taking me hours to get past the guards. Mask, huh? I suppose Conway sent you to get me. No, I haven't seen Bart Conway. I'm doggone glad of that. He ain't never been the kind to send a man sneaking in to drill me like a dog. I didn't come here to drill you, Halstead. Well, that That's gun Only right. for my own protection. Came to talk to you. What for? About the range war. If Conway sent you, Tully Mile fight until he sends back the steers he put a running iron on. What's that? Sure, he's been changing my H brand to his own B brand. Is that what Conway's supposed to have done? Not supposed, it's what he done. Story is that you started the trouble by damming the water so it didn't cross his land. That's a not an out lie. The chances are he had his own men damn it just to give him a reason to steal my cattle. Then he could claim he was just getting even. That isn't Conway's way of doing things, Halstead. Ain't my way of doing things to damn that water, either. You didn't need the water. Of course I didn't. I got more water here than I can use. Do you suppose this whole range war was started by someone else? Huh? What's that? Someone who wanted you two to be at each other's throats? No, of course it ain't. Conway wanted my prize steer, so he took him. Then when he seen I'd learned about it, he damned the water. How many men have you lost so far? That ain't none of your business. I don't know who you are, and I won't listen to you no longer. Conway sent you here to try and make peace. Well, there won't be none till he returns them steers. What about the water? The dam stays put till I get the steers back. And he probably will keep the steers until you release the water. There's some of my boys now. Hey, fellas, come and get this hombre. You come fast. Tonto. Uh, what is it, Tonto? You come fast. Tonto, see plenty. Very well, Tonto. I'll see you later, Holtz. Where are my men? Have they all been shot up? Gate, Clem, where are you? Get the boss, We're coming, boss. Watch out. Get that man. Get him. Get him up. Who's that? A masked man. Come from Conway, I figure. We ain't no horses here. How do you get in? Got past the guard somehow. We'll get after him. No. Wait, boys. I see through it. Let him go. But, boss, it's he got it. That's what it is. A trick of Conway's. He wants you to chase after them two, and that'll take you away from the house. Then his men can come here. Let them two go. Stick right here and double the guard. Them two slip past somehow. Double the guard, and if either that masked man or the redskin shows up again, shoot up. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. The Lone Ranger and Tonto rode hard toward the western boundary of the Halstead Ranch. On the way, Tonto described the man named Pete. He told the masked man how he'd followed him and had seen him letting cattle through Halstead's fence. And then, Tonto, you say this man took cash from the man he turned the cattle over to? Not right. And it must have been Pete who started the range war. He started it simply to keep both ranchers so busy fighting 
Their men wouldn't be able to watch the stock. Wait. Post oh, 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 oh. What is it, Tubber? You look. Look. You see campfire? Yes. I see it. Looks as if they're branding cattle over there. Not right. Stay here, Tano. Keep an eye on the camp. I'm going to ride back and get Bill Halstead to see this. I don't watch them. Come on, Silver. Here's where we end this rain for. I am Silver! Away! The masked rider raced back to the house, unaware that Halstead's men were waiting for him. They saw him ride out of the darkness and rushed to meet him with drawn guns. Get your hands up! Over there! You die! That's him, all right! Wait a minute, man! I want to speak to your boss! I want to see Bill Holstead! Ain't no need to see him! We got orders to grill you on sight! Captured by the men who tried to help, the masked man faces exposure and death. Before the next exciting scene, please permit us to pause for just a few moments. Now to continue our story. The Lone Ranger riding to get Bill Halstead and show him that rustlers had been at work was captured by Halstead's men. Ain't no use you arguing, mister. Our boss says that you come from Conway and try to get us to follow you. But why would I do that? Because the chances are Conway's men are ready to close in on the ranch house as soon as we was to leave and follow you. Man, listen to me. Ain't the wasting the time. Take his guns and mask and we'll drill him. Well, well, you're going to shoot me. Might give me a chance to tell you just one thing. That's fair enough. Go on, talk. After I've gone, one of you will get my horse. That's so. Hadn't thought of that. Good horse, too. I never seen the like of it. Sort of a long story I have to tell you, but I want to be sure and see that this horse has good care. Sure, we'll see to that. Any one of us admires good horse flesh. But you'll have to hear this story. Hold on. This critter's just calling for time. That's what he's doing. Figuring on some of his parts coming to help him. Is that the case? By thunder, I bet it is. I'm dealing with you right now. Me, too. He slipped past me when I was on guard. I wanted to go after him then, but he was accommodating and come right back this way. There's his help. To the south, Tonto. Hey, look out there. Get them, Silver. Get them all, boy. Look out for that devil horse. Will him. That's Come on, Silver. Get up, stop it. Yeah. Come on, Silver. I hope you hear the shots. I'm running, Tonto. He drew the attention just in time to let me swing Silver into them. Now, what we do? We can't get the horse set now. His men are gunning for us. Not right. But we might be able to reach the other side. We'll go and see about Conway. I owe Silver. Conway was sleeping when the Lone Ranger and Tonto managed to reach his ranch house. Tonto was left to stand guard while the masked man opened the door and entered the house itself. Once inside, he found Bart's room and walking to the side of his bed, gripped the rancher by the shoulder. Wake up, Bart, wake up. Where they at? Let me at the only water thieves. Where's my six gun? Take it easy, Conway. <laughs> I reckon I was dreaming. Hey, who are you? My name wouldn't mean anything. How'd you get in here? Let me get a light. You don't need a light to listen to me. Hold on. I heard that voice before. Talk some more. I've come from Halstead's. What? Why, that old... Halstead's all right, Bart. Just as square as you are. Found that out for myself. By thunderation, I wish I could remember where I've heard that voice before. Wish there was some light in this room. I reckon you're holding a gun on me, ain't you? No, I don't need to hold a gun on you, Bart. Because I can draw it if it's needed. You saw me draw my guns a long time ago. Hmm. Keep talking. That time, they were going to hang you for a murder you didn't do. An Indian saw the murder, and it took quite a while to convince the sheriff... Hold on. I remember now. There was a man that saved me from hanging. I hid out in a cave with him while the law worked to find me. That's right, Bart. A white horse, a mask. Are you masked? Yes. Thunderation, why didn't you say so? How'd you get here? What are you doing here? Why did you see Halstead? One question at a time, Bart. Now listen, 
Both you and Halstead are strong-willed men. He thinks you stole his cattle just as you think he damned the water to keep it from you. I never stole cattle in my life. What would I want of his critters? I got a plenty of my own. What do he want with your water? There's more than he can use even in the dry weather. Just ornery cousinness. No. A third man did both those things just to start a range war. What? Just to keep you and Halstead busy. The cattle could be taken from both of you. You won't quit fighting till Halstead releases the water. And he won't release the water until you send him the cattle he thinks you've stolen. Stranger, I'd do anything you ask, almost. But I'm darned if I'll back down. I can't do it. If I was to go to him with peace terms, I'd be the laughing stock of the county. Pride, Bart. You're going to let more men get killed because of your pride. Let Halstead come to me. I can't reach Halstead. The men are ready to shoot me on sight. I'd sooner go broke, lose all my cattle, see all my men shot down, or get shot down myself. Then to go and kowtow to Bill Halstead. With both of you feeling that way, this war can go on as long as there's a man alive on either side. Just so. This war goes on unless Halstead comes to me, takes back what he said about me stealing his cattle, and lets that water come through my land again. Very well, Bart. I've done my best. There's one favor I'd like to ask of you. I told you I'd do most anything you ask. But I won't back down in this fight. What I'm going to ask is very simple. Name it, mister. A friend of mine will come here in the morning asking for a job. Gunman? No, cook. Cook? Well, I got a Chinese. This man is an Indian and a good cook. Hmm. Well, we can always use a good cook. If that's all you want, send him around. He'll be on hand first thing in the morning. I'll tell the guards to let him by. Thanks, Bart. Well, that beats me. They'd like him to give up trying to stop the war. Yet, by Ginger, that's just what he seems to have done. <laughs> It's him, all right. There ain't but one man shouts like that. The Lone Ranger. Shortly after breakfast the next morning, Bart Conway went to his bunkhouse. Oh. What's the matter with all you men? Your horses are waiting in the corral. Oh, boss, we're ailing something awful. What's the matter? I don't know what it is. We all feel like we've been poisoned. Well, get yourself the saddle and you'll feel better. The boys just came in from the Halstead place. They're eating now and we ain't no guards on the job or nothing. Get going. I can't move a step to no saddle, boss. I'm sick. Me too. All they're hanging for us to keep horizontal. I feel like I've been poisoned, boss. Poison? Maybe some more work in that Halstead outfit. They wouldn't use poison. They sure enough use something. I'll find out about this. Hey, you. I want to see you. What you want? What are you doing with that horse? This scout. Him, Tonto's horse. I know it's your horse, all right, but what are you cinching up for? Me right way now. But you was the cook here. And that's what I want to speak about. Mm, Tonto cooked breakfast. Yeah, and half my men are ailing. You know anything about it? All men get sick by and by. What's that? Other fella eat now. Yeah, but By you... and by, them be sick too. Mean to say you poisoned that food? No. But you just said... He it... put medicine in food. Medicine? Not right. Steady. Steady, Scott. Hold on. Get down from that horse. You ain't going nowhere till I get done questioning you. And if you laid up all my men by thunderation, you'll swing for it. Even if you are the masked man's friend. Men be all right in two, maybe three days. Dead wretch, I'll... You not shoot. Hey, hey, you kicked away my gun, I'll... Get him up, Scout. I'll kill you for this. Come on, Scout. That same afternoon in the town cafe. So the hull of the Conway outfit's laid up, sick of bed. That's what I heard tell, Sheriff, and I guess it's straight enough. Bob don't get his facts wrong. I wonder what'll happen to the few. Now they ain't no one for Halstead to fight again. Just so. Wonder if he'll attack while Conway is hampered, so. No, that ain't Halstead's style. I I wonder if Big Bill knows about it. Seen any of his men around here, Barkeep? Ain't seen high nor hair of any of them, no, sir. Reckon we're all busy guarding Halstead's ranch house since that mass man got away. I've heard about him. Doggone, I'd like to get a hold of him again. He slipped past me once. Well, I'll see you later, Barkeep. Yes, sirree. Sheriff. Hey, Leaping lightning flash. Take it easy. You? Yes. I thought you'd be interested in what I have to tell you. I'm interested in... No, don't slap, brother. You can't get away with this for long. 
Someone will come by here and see you holding a gun on me and wearing a mask. Then by dawn, you That's will... That's why you must listen without wasting any time. All of Bart Conway's men are laid up. I know. My friend put medicine in their food. That redskin? I'll get him, too. No, you won't. Because that's going to be the means of ending this range war. What? What's that, stranger? You can get to Halsey's place, can't you? I'd like to see him try to stop me. Then go there as fast as you can. If you'll do what I ask, you'll end the range war. Why are you so interested in ending that war? Because both Halstead and Conway are good men. They should be working together against certain crooks who live here. Meaning? A man named Pete. Ain't never been nothing proved again him. One of your own deputies and huh? half a dozen other men. Now, will you listen to me? Put that iron in leather, stranger, and start talking. After the sheriff had listened to the Lone Ranger, he went to Halstead's ranch, arriving there in the late afternoon. Halstead began the conversation. Now, there ain't no use you trying to tell me to stop fighting, Sheriff. I won't do it. I know better than to suggest anything as sensible as that, Halstead. What I do object to is the means you use. Huh? It ain't right nor just to try and poison all of our carved men. Who says I done that? Name the pole cat that accuses me of using poison. I ain't naming nobody. But the facts are that every one of Conway's bodies is sick of bed. Oh, is that so? Yep. Looks to be some sort of poison that got into that grub. I thought you'd know something about it. You know better than that. I hoped you wouldn't use such means of carrying on a range war. How bad are they? Oh, they'll pull around in a day or two, but meantime, Conway's alone there. He ain't even a guard to help him. Shucks, I can't fight a man in that condition. That's the way to be, Hall said. I all said you was a fair hombre. I thought I'd tell you. But as soon as his men are around, they'll be heading here again, trying to get past my guards and smash that dam. Reckon so. And I won't let him. Not till he fetches back that cattle. I didn't dam the water, but as long as the dam is there, it stays there. It's a darn shame you've got to neglect your ranch so much. I bet you ain't had line riders out since the feud began. How could I? I'm most afraid to see what my fences look like. They ain't been checked in weeks. Might have a lot of stray cattle by this time. Gee, with Conway out of the fight for a couple of days, I can have my men tend to some of the work here. That's right, Halstead. Wait, I'll get them started right away. Hey, you call in the boys. We're riding west to check the lines. Have all the men ready to ride and work all night. All right, boss. Uh, I'm glad you come and told me that, Sheriff. I've been worried about them fences. We'll be ready to ride in no time. All set, boys? Yeah. Sheriff staying at the house? Yeah. Go ahead, Halstead. Don't worry about your house. I look after it. Maybe spend the night here. Come on, boys. Get up there. Get up there. Get up there. Get up there. It worked out just right. Now to meet the masked man. Then follow them, boys, so the law will be on hand for the showdown. After dark, Halstead and his line rider spotted a campfire. They waited for a few moments, then circled it, while Pete and the deputy sheriff huddled close to the fire, not suspecting that they were seen. Ah, oh, stop worrying, deputy. There ain't none of the Halstead men coming this far from the house. Not while the war is on. I plan the war for that reason. But the war ain't on right now, Pete. Conway's outfit is sick in bed. Uh, I ain't worried. Hey, you lazy galoots. Get them running irons hot fast. We got a lot of doggies to brand tonight. Ain't but a few hours for the boys will meet us and take them over. That's all we need to know. What's that? Keep your hands high and stand up. Halstead. We heard what you said. Well, you started the war. Damn the creek and ran the running iron on our cow. And cut the line. I just wish you'd make a move, Pete. Just move and give me a reason to shoot you. Never mind, Halstead. I'll deal with him. Sure. Yep. I've been a long time trying to prove something on you, Pete. All right. What are you going to do about it? Uh, plenty. And that goes for you, too, Deputy. And all the rest of you. Well, I thought you was at the house, Sheriff. Couldn't stay there, Halstead. I had to be here to make a rest. You knew these snakes was here? Uh, I had a good idea the masked man told the truth. Who? The masked man that made Conway's men sick. So you'd ride lines and find Pete here. I reckon when I tell Bart the truth, the two of you can shake hands. There's eh? nothing I'd admire to do more, doggone it. I Silver, old boy! Settlers are in trouble! We 
You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash c slash g-a-r, brought to you by g3pl.com. Now, Post Toasties, the heap good cornflakes, is proud to present Gunsmoke. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, the story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. It's easy to do your whole tribe a big favor, Mother. Just pour every big and little Indian in your camp a breakfast bowl full of Post Toasties. Post Toasties, you know, are the heat good cornflakes. They're the best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. Fresh as fresh can be. Say, Post Toasties are crackling crisp. Sweet kernel corn flavor, toasted. That's Post Toasties. Post Toasties are packed with nourishment, too. A bowl of Post Toasties with sugar and milk helps your big braves and little Indians start the day right. Get Post Toasties soon. And now, gun smoke. Starring William Conrad. Fella here looking for you, Mr. Dillon. Oh, hello. My name is Brant, Marshal. I and my son got to ranch up in the South Fork of the Solomon. Oh, well, what can I do for you, Mr. Brant? Well, uh, I ain't no ways responsible, you understand. It's been kind of uh, put on me, you might say. Oh? <laughs> what has? Well, Marshal, uh, well, the engine started it. Hey, they was riding for horses just a couple of days ago. And they'd have got them and probably me, too, but for this kid they had along. A kid? Yeah. And he tried to come in ahead of the rest of the Indians, and he showed himself too soon is what happened. My son saw him in time to warn me, and we put up a standoff fight, and them Arapahoes didn't get a single horse. Well, what's the trouble, then? We got the kid. He's still there, wilder than a deer. He got shot in the leg a little. We brought him into the house after. Uh, I want to know what to do with him, Marshal. Oh. Well, uh, how old's the boy, Mr. Brandt? Hard to say. I bet he's uh, 12 or under. That's pretty young to be on a raiding party. Yeah, it sure is. But he's awful wild. He's tried to kill me twice already. Well, then why don't you turn him over to a reservation somewhere? They'll take care of him. Oh, I can't do that, Marshal. It wouldn't happen. Why not? Well, he ain't an Indian. He's a white boy. A white boy? Sure acts like an Indian, though. I think he's been living with them Arapahoes a long time. That's what I think. Well, I don't know what I can do about it, Mr. Bryant. Uh, one thing is sure, Marshal, I can't keep him no more. And it don't seem right, you know, for a white boy to go back living among them Arapahoes. No. So you got to come up there with me and do something about him. Well, but Mr. Bryant, I'm <laughs> U.S. Marshal. I'm hired to keep the peace, not to play nursemaid to orphans. Yeah. You were the only man I've heard of around here that I thought might help that boy. Well, if you want, you want. I'll just run him off into the prairie, I guess. All, all right. All right, Mr. Brandt. We'll ride back with you in the morning. <laughs> Uh, 
I don't see nobody around, Mr. Brandt. No, no, my son will be out with the cattle this time of day. I told him I locked that kid in the potato cellar when he had to leave the house. Is that it over there? That's it. He'll be in there. Oh, there. I'll just open the door, Marshal. Maybe he'll come out. All right. Uh, Chester, grab him if he runs, huh? Yes, sir. Watch out for him. He'll do anything, that kid. Hey, kid. Come on out. Stand back now. What? Well, look at him. You'd hardly know he was a white boy, Mr. Dillon. Hello, son. You've come to kill me, haven't you? Oh, my goodness. Nobody's going to kill you, son. We're here to help you, that's all. <laughs> you look pretty weak to me. Is it that hole in your leg, or haven't they been feeding you? He won't eat, Marshal. At least he wouldn't when I left. You been eating, kid? No. See what I mean? It's easier to be tortured on an empty stomach. Oh, now, son, nobody's going to torture you. Nobody's going to kill you. I'd just like to have a look at that leg where you got hit. I'm all right. Come on. Uh, let's go in the house and see for sure. Huh? No. <laughs> well, he's fainted. I got him. Oh, the poor little kid. Why haven't you done anything about this bullet in his leg, Brent? I tried, Marshal. He wouldn't let me near it. Tried to bite me. Well, he can't fight now. Come on, show me where to put him. I carried the boy into the house, laid him out on a bed, and went to work. He came, too, in the middle of it. But he didn't move a muscle or utter a sound. The bullet wasn't buried very deep. I dug it out, cleaned the wound as best I could. When it was over, I got some strong tea down him, and then he went to sleep. A couple of hours later, I noticed he'd waked up, and I went over to the bed. You fixed my leg? Sure, of course I did. Why? Well, you might have died if I hadn't. A wound like that gets infected. Rappahoes don't care if their prisoners die. Well, I, you're not a prisoner here. Yes, I am. Uh, look, what's your name, anyway? Yorkie. Well, is that all? It's all I remember. Is that what the Arapahoes tell you? Yes. They won't give me another name till I'm a brave. Yorkie's a white man's name. Where are your parents? Killed in a raid, they told me. I've been a Rappahoe ever since. Uh, what was your father's name, do you know? I was too young. Well, then how come you remember English so well? An old man of the tribe makes me talk every day. I don't know where he learned, but he says it'll come to use later when I'm a brave. In our wars against the white man. You're a white man, Yorkie. Yes, but I live with the Arapahoes. Well, you did, but you're back among your own people now. you got to learn to live a different life. No. Wait. You mean you want to go back with the Indians? First, I have to make a big coup. Make a big coup? What for? I'll be killed if I don't. What are you talking about? I allowed myself to be seen and expose the raiding party. So I'll be killed if I don't make a coup and return with a scalp or some horses. You? A kid like you? Unless you kill me first. Oh, Yorkie, if I was going to kill you, why did I take that bullet out of your leg? I don't know. Well, nobody's going to kill you. Now, you just get that out of your head. And you're not going to kill anybody either or steal any horses. So forget about it. If I make a big coup, my mistake on the raid will be forgiven. And I'll be the youngest brave in the whole tribe. Well, we'll argue about that later. But what were you doing on this raid in the first place? A white boy must prove himself many times. It's harder than for an Indian. That's why they let me come. Oh, I see. Yeah, you've got quite a problem, haven't you, Yuki? But uh, right now, why don't you go back to sleep for a while, huh? I'll have some soup for you when you wake up. Oh, 
Well, good morning, Mr. Bryan. Good morning, Chester. <clears throat> Marshal. Good morning. Your son left a few minutes ago. He said he wouldn't be back till evening. Yeah, and I ought to be out with him. We're all through, but I'll cook you some eggs. Oh, just coffee for me. All right, sir. Well, what are you going to do about that kid, Marshal? Well, there's not much I can do, Brant. You can't leave him here. Uh, well, I didn't bring him here. Here you are. Uh, Marshal, I'm serious. Even if it was an ordinary kid, I got no way to raise him. And this one is is bad. I told you, he's been after me twice already. Well, he needs a scalp to take back. It's a matter of life or death with him. He ain't taking mine. You really think he might kill somebody, Mr. Dillon? Well, left alone, yes. But he's so young. Well, I heard Billy the Kid killed a man when he was 12. Age doesn't seem to matter much. Well, can't you talk him out of it? Show him it's wrong? Oh, I've tried, but Yorkie thinks like an Indian. He doesn't know anything about the white man's world. Yeah. How's he feeling this morning, anyway? Well, I'd hoped his fever would be down, but... It isn't. He needs a doctor, that's what. Yeah. Uh, by the way, Brant, is this one of your guns? Well, where'd you get it? Yorkie had it, and I went in there this morning. But he was too weak to use it. Well, I told you it's a bad one, Marshal. He'll kill someone yet. All Yorkie understands right now is kill or be killed, Brant. Uh, if you got a wagon, we'll take him into Dodge. <laughs> Say, what goes on at your house at breakfast? Well, you can take it from me. The best thing that can go on your breakfast table is Post Toasties. Yes, sir, Post Toasties, the heat good cornflakes. Those golden crisp cornflakes are the best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. You know how to prove it? Well, just pour out breakfast bowlfuls of Post Toasties for your whole tribe. Then watch how they enjoy them. Post Toasties are crisp and tasty. From the first bite down to the last spoonful, that sweet kernel corn flavor makes your breakfast. So always ask for Post Toasties, the heap good corn flakes. Post Toasties, heap good corn flakes. The best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. Heap good corn flakes. Post Toasties, heap good corn flakes. Remember, Post Toasties is one of the famous triple wrap post cereals Guaranteed fresh or triple your money back. Now back to Gunsmoke. On the drive into Dodge, Yorkie never moved or never said a word. I looked back at him from time to time and tried to put myself in his place. Here was a boy whose only experience of life had been with a warlike tribe of Indians, a tribe which he couldn't even go back to without a white man's scalp or some stolen horses. Now, this in itself would be a problem for a grown man. But little Yorkie also put himself a prisoner, sooner or later to be killed. It was no wonder that during the next few days as he lay on the couch in Doc's office, he watched us with wild, restless eyes. In spite of his obvious courage, I think he was a little frightened. And when Doc was suddenly called out on a case in the country for several days, I had an idea. And I sent Chester to find Kitty. You want me to nurse him? Is that it, Matt? Well, partly, but also I thought maybe you could talk to him a little. It's... Uh... Oh, it's hard for him to trust a man. I know. Chester told me about him. Yeah, he'll be well enough pretty soon to get into trouble. Bad trouble. I'll do what I can. Where is he, in the front room? Yeah, on Doc's couch. And, uh, Kitty, uh, try to get him to eat something, huh? <laughs> I haven't had much luck. All right. But you stay here. Yeah, sure. Hello, Yorkie. Who are you? My name's Kitty. I'm going to take care of you. 
Why? Because you're sick. Wouldn't you take care of somebody who's sick? Not an enemy. <laughs> we're not enemies, Yorkie. Even if we were, I'd take care of you. Prisoners get well by themselves, or they die. Not about me, they don't. Anyway, you're not a prisoner. You can leave any time you want to. Is that the truth? Of course it is. Unless you do something wrong, like killing or stealing. But let's not talk about all that. I want to know about you. All sorts of things. What it was like with the Arapahoes, or what you remember about when you were younger. I won't tell any secrets. I don't want to know any secrets, Yorkie. But maybe you can tell me... Well, did you have a mother in the tribe? Tell me about that. I'm a white boy. They've never let me have a mother. Anyway, I was big enough, I didn't need one. Did you ever want one, Yorkie? I don't know. I, I guess so, sometimes. It's better to have a mother. Mine was killed in a raid when they found me. I know. Do you remember her at all? No. Sometimes I think I do. Sometimes when I'm asleep, that is. What do you remember about her then? I don't know. Just a feeling, I guess. Sort of like being warm. Is that what it's like? Yeah. I think that's what it's like, Yorkie. Very much like that. I'm hungry, Kitty. Could you let me have something to eat? Of course I will, Yorkie. Of course I will. Kitty spent as much time with Yorkie as she could manage. And whenever she'd been with him, he always seemed calmer and less frightened. And we began to have hopes that maybe the boy would take to his new life after all. Chester and I were busy, and except for taking some food up now and then, we turned Yorkie's care over to Kitty completely. When will Doc be back, Mr. Dillon? Oh, I forgot to tell you, Chester. He sent word he'd have to be out there another day. I guess Miss Taylor's been mighty sick. Mm. You think maybe Yorkie could just live with Doc? Ah, uh, I don't know what to do with him, Chester. Well, we sure got to do something. With him. Yeah. Where's Yorkie? What? Uh, well, he's upstairs, Kitty. Have you been up there today? Have you seen him? Uh, no, I... I thought you were with him. I couldn't get here till now. Yorkie's gone, Matt. What? I'll go take a look. I've already searched the place. He isn't there. Well, let's look in the street, Chester. Maybe somebody's seen him. You better find him. That's all I can say. Yeah, we'll find him, Kitty. Don't worry. Maybe he's got hold of a gun. Yeah, I hope not. Anyway, if he's as smart as I think he is, he'll locate a horse to get away on first. Maybe a couple of them. Doggone it. Just when I was beginning to think he was going to settle down a little. Uh, you never know. But I still got faith in that kid somehow, Chester. Ah, uh, here, let's cross over to Moss Grimmick's stable there, huh? All right, sir. There's Moss now, just inside there. Yeah. Moss? Oh, Marshal, Chester. Oh, Moss? Yeah, I was going to come see you, Marshal. Oh? That kid you brought in the other day, I caught him trying to steal one of my horses. You got Yorkie? Is that his name? Where is he, Moss? Back here. He put up quite a fight for a sick boy, Marshal. A little wildcat. I had to tie him up finally. I throwed him in the saddle room there. He's sure a mean one. There he is, little devil. He'll hang yet. Give me your knife, Chester. Oh, don't untie him, Marshal. I'll handle him, Moss. Here you are, Mr. Dillon. Ah. Yorkie, I'm sorry this happened. Uh, I'd have given you a horse if you'd asked me. Ah, there. I wasn't going to steal him. And what was you doing riding him out of that stall, young fellow? Wait a minute, Moss. Yorkie, 
You say you weren't going to steal him? No. Well, what were you doing, then? Kitty didn't come, and I got lonely. I don't know. Well, I... I think I do, Yorkie. You just wanted to be around something familiar, something you know. Isn't that right? I guess so. And you've lived with horses all your life. You know them pretty well. So you came over here. I wasn't going to steal them. I just wanted to get on them. You know, I half believe the boy, Marsh. He's telling the truth, Moss. Yorkie, I'm sorry I treated you rough. Why don't you tell me? You are going to kill me. Me? Kill anybody? A kid? I guess you don't know me very well. What are you going to do with me now? Well, uh, Doc will be back tomorrow, Yorkie. If he says it's okay for you to stay up, well, you can. In the meantime, Kitty will be there. All right. Tell you what, Yorkie. You get well, you come over here. I'll give you a horse to ride. You will? Sure. I got lots of horses. You can take your pick. What if I steal them? I've had horses stole before. I don't understand you. He trusts you, Yorkie. We all do. You shouldn't. You shouldn't trust anybody. Oh, maybe not, but we do anyway. Uh, Moss, I, I got an idea. No. I, um, I don't suppose you could use a stable boy around here, huh? Some kid who really knows horses and who's used to hard work. Well, I don't have much money, Marshal. I could feed him a little and maybe fix him in bed in the saddle room here. Of course, a good boy's like a good horse. There's bound to be some hot blood in him. Try to lift my hair, I'll whop him good. That clear young fella? You're talking about me? Of course they're talking about you, Yorkie. One thing, I can't hire nobody less than he has a whole name. Well, Yorkie don't know his last name. Well, call him anything. Uh, uh, Kelly. Kelly, that's a good name. Yorkie Kelly? Grimmick and Kelly. Yeah, sounds all right to me. You people get out of here now. I got work to do. And when Doc says you're fit in Yorkie, you come back. I'll be back, Moss. In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's adventure on Gunsmoke. Say, exciting things happen to breakfast when there's sugar crinkles at every plate. Sure, new sugar crinkles make breakfast more fun than a circus. You know why? Sugar crinkles is the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. Not too sweet, the way some sugar crinkled cereals seem to be, and not like others that aren't sweet enough. Sugar crinkles, every golden crisp nugget of them, is just right sweet. So try starting your day off just right with new sugar crinkles. And don't forget, when you're listening to the radio or watching television, sugar crinkles make great snacks. From the bowl or from the pack, for your breakfast or a snack, sugar crinkles are more fun than a circus. Try sugar crinkles soon. They're the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. So better get several packages.
Sanka Coffee and Instant Sanka, the two delicious coffees that let you sleep, bring you Sanka Salutes. And this is Whit Elliott transcribed, saluting our people of the week, the everyday people who help make America an even nicer place in which to live. This is for all fathers listening in. Got a question for you, Dad. Suppose you got a hurry call from home saying that a certain stork which had been hovering around your house for weeks finally had started coming in for a landing. Can you imagine yourself stopping for anything? No. Well, then you pull up a chair, Dad, and hear all about a Navy vet named Charles Yule. You see, this week, Charles was rushing home so he could get his wife to the hospital in time to have their very first child. But on the way, Charles saw a terrible thing. A woman had gone off a bridge. A woman was floundering in the freezing water of a New York City river. Well, Charles Yule knew a thing or two about the horrors of people fighting death in the water. During the war, he'd rescued two drowning shipmates. And just a few years ago, he'd pulled a little girl out of the surf. Of course, now it was different. There was the store. Charlie wavered, and then he made his decision. Into the water he dived. He reached the woman. He held her, and he saved her life. And then, of course, the hero dashed home. Well, fortunately, the stork had cooperated, and Daddy was able to greet his first son. And so tonight, Charles Yule stands in a hospital corridor and looks proudly through a glass at a little boy. He certainly set him a real example of manhood. And so to Papa Yule, a cooing, gurgling, sank a salute. And now hear the story of the men of the USS George E. Davis and a nine-year-old Italian war orphan named Maria Carmela Lavecchia. The Davis is an American destroyer escort, and about a year ago, the men aboard her decided to adopt Maria. They didn't know her. They'd never seen her. But they knew what kids like Maria were going through, so they, they filled out the papers and collected money. Enough for schooling, enough for food, even for her very first doll. And then, some time ago, they decided to give her the finest gift of all, a trip to America, a chance to see a decent and happy world, a chance to be just a little girl. Well, she's here now, and she's having the time of her life with her 200 fathers. And so, in her name, to the wonderful young men of the George E. Davis, this very proud Sanka salute. In a moment, a story about a lonely, forgotten hero. But first, say, what is it you look for most in a coffee? Is it a full-bodied flavor, or is it the ease of preparation you get from an instant coffee? Well, you know you get both of those great advantages, plus a third in instant Sanka coffee. That third advantage, instant Sanka lets you sleep. Yes, the only coffee in the world that gives you all three advantages is the new instant Sanka coffee. Taste it made hot and black and good and strong, and you'll know right off it has the extra-rich flavor you want. Instant Sanka is made instantly right in the cup, whether you're making one cup or a dozen. And it lets you sleep because 97% of the sleep-disturbing caffeine has been removed. Yes, drink Instant Sanka whenever you please, and it won't keep you awake. And now you can buy Instant Sanka in the big new economy size jar and save money. So drink Instant Sanka, the only coffee that combines extra-rich flavor with instant ease and lets you sleep. Say, would you have done what Mr. Orville Ratliff did down in Louisville this week, and when it was all over, would you feel the way he does? Well, Mr. Ratliff was a bystander when a car crashed and the gas tank exploded. He didn't know the man inside the car. The whole thing wasn't his affair. But he went into those flames, and he pulled out the man, and he saved his life. The result? Orville Ratliff went to the hospital severely burned in terrible pain. The other man, fortunately, was hardly hurt at all. And up to the middle of this week, at least, do you know how many visitors this hero has had? Zero. Not one. He might be bitter, this brave but lonely man, but he isn't. He says when the pain allows him to talk, I'd do it again. How about somebody going in and saying... You are listening to Golden Age Radio. Rumble.com slash C slash G-A-R. Brought to you by G3PL.com. says, the private avenger has been succeeded by the judge. You'd do well to remember that before you decide to take the law into your own hands. Have 
of Gun Will Travel. Starring Mr. John Daner as Paladin. San Francisco, 1875. The Carlton Hotel. Headquarters of a man called Paladin. Oh, good morning, Mr. Paladin. Good morning, hey boy. You go out early. Yes, indeed. Nothing like a brisk walk before breakfast. It's a very nice day. Oh, yes. Warm sunshine. It's delightful. The years at the spring and days at the morn. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Mornings Paladin. at seven. Uh, the... You forgot to pick up mail last night. But it's a lot of come for you. Oh, thank you, hey boy. I'm Sid Muller, Beaver Fork, Montana. Hmm? I uh, see. Here, Mr. Paladin, your reputation for taking hold of a situation has reached this town, and I would very... Uh, thank you. Uh. Hey, boy. Yes, sir? Uh, Sid Muller says he needs my services, wants me to get up there to Beaver Fork as soon as possible, so will you go down to the hotel basement where my trunk is stored and dig out that winter clothing we just packed away? Oh, yes, sir. Uh... So bad you have to leave when we have such a nice day in San Francisco. Yes, yes, hey, boy. Oh, well. Mr. Muller enclosed a very handsome check. Constipation can be a problem for anyone, even doctors. And when constipation occurs, it's interesting to see just what doctors consider important about a laxative they might use or recommend. Well, the majority of the doctors we heard from had this to say. A laxative should be effective, gentle, close to natural acting. A medicine that can be used with complete confidence. Now, X-Lax has been popular with many doctors and millions of people over the years because chocolated X-Lax is effective. Overnight, it helps you toward your normal regularity. X-Lax is so gentle, so close to natural acting, there's no upset. That's why many doctors and millions of people use X-Lax with complete confidence. X-Lax, the laxative that helps you toward your normal regularity, gently, overnight. <laughs> For most of the country, the year was at the spring, but northern Montana was having a late winter. I reached the settlement just 20 miles from Beaver Fork when a blizzard hit. The storm raged for 10 days, and when the sky finally cleared, the snow was piled in roof-high drifts, and the roads were eight feet under. I had found Mrs. Abbott's boarding house, home cooking, clean beds, reasonably comfortable, and my fellow lodgers were quite pleasant. Good morning, Paladin. Morning. Hey, where do you think you're going all rigged up like that? I'm leaving, old timer. I've already wasted too much time. Oh, now, looky here. You ain't aiming to take out over that mountain, are you? I have to. I should have been in Beaver Fork over two weeks ago. Well, it must be important if it can't wait till the trail clears up. A man sent for me, uh, Sid Muller. Did you know him? Sure, I know Sid. Know the rest of the bunch, too. There's uh, four Mullers up this way. They ain't been in these parts long, about a year, maybe. Oh, well, he said he needed me. Have you bothered to take a good look at the snow hanging on them peaks? <laughs> well, there's lots of it. Yeah, just like it was in 59. Oh, big jiggers, I'll never forget that. What happened? Avalanche. Oh. Biggest avalanche ever heard of in these parts. Well, I'll just have to take my chances. Bye, old timer. I followed the floor of a wide, white valley for several miles, then turned toward the mountain. A hunter passed me, his rifle slung easy across his arm. He smiled, waved, and went on, and I started to climb. Halfway up the slope, I stopped to rest on a narrow ledge. Below me, on the flat land, I could see the hunter, and apparently he had spotted his quarry, for he raised the rifle to his shoulder and fired. I looked up ahead to see if he had made his kill. The body of a man lay sprawled in the snow. And then it came. 
like a whisper at first, and a slow, almost gentle movement, and then a low rumble that built to a deafening roar, and a great white cloud that moved toward me and met me. Herder's cabin. I found it holed up here during the storm. My name's Daniel Carr. Did you dig me out of that snow? Mm. A handful at a time. You were under there three hours. Three hours? You fell by a boulder, created an air pocket, and you managed to survive. Usually one slide will start another. You were risking your life to rescue me. Perhaps. Well, how did you get me here? I carried you. You're quite a load. Why did you do it? Well, after all, I realized it was the reverberation from my shot that caused the slide. I felt responsible. No, but why did you take the trouble to save me? I, I saw you deliberately shoot a man. I know. But you see, when I mean for my gun to kill a man, I'll point it at him, take aim, and pull the trigger. Didn't it occur to you that I'm the only witness to the murder you committed? Well, that's true, of course. But that's beside the point. Well, much obliged. I don't mention it. Now, I'll see if I can rustle your bite to eat. Talk about best selling records. Here's a familiar tune about America's best-selling filter cigarette, Winston. because only Winston has filter blend up front. Choice, flavorful tobaccos, specially selected and specially processed for filter smoking. No wonder Winston tastes good, like a cigarette should. Smoke Winston. I recovered from the shock and exposure in a couple of days. But it developed I had a badly wrenched knee and couldn't walk. I was helpless and became further indebted to Daniel Carr for excellent care. And I must admit, as pleasant a companion as I enjoyed in some time. Now, wait, the queen takes the rook. Yes, yes, but the other white rook takes the queen. Ah, uh -huh, but the interposition of the knight then no. postpones the mate. Only no. one more move. No, no. Well, someday when we have a chessboard and pieces, I'll show you. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. I'll be looking forward to that. Yeah, that gun. What's the matter? Looks like I'm out of tobacco. Oh, well, hand me my rucksack. Mm -hmm. Here. Uh, ought to be an extra can of tobacco in here. How's the leg feel today? Oh, it's much better. Good. Guess I'll have to face up to the fact that I have a job to do. Yes, I will too. Uh, where's that tobacco? Oh, yeah. Here it is. Good. Hey, keep it. Oh, thanks. Oh, uh, here, this letter fell out of the sack. Uh, from the man I have business with in Beaver Fork, Sid Muller. That's the man I have business with. Oh? He's next on my list. List? To kill. 
Why? I haven't asked you any questions, Paladin. Yeah, that's right, but does Sid and Muller know he's on your list? I think he does. Well, uh, Daniel, I... I think it's only fair to tell you. My gun is for hire. Now, Muller sent for me probably to protect him from you. And perhaps we'll meet again. I sort of hated to say goodbye anyway. It's been very pleasant. Are you leaving? I made my plans this morning, as soon as I saw you could get around. So I'd better get started, especially if you're going to be working for Muller. I'd hate to have to point my gun at you, Paladin. And I would, you know, if you got in the way of the job I have to do. Well, so long. Thanks again for the tobacco. Thank you for saving my life. It was a pleasure. For three days in a row, I tried to work my way down the trail from the cabin to the valley. And each time, my knee gave way, and I had to give up and crawl back over the hard-packed snow. But on the fourth day, I made it. It was bitterly cold, and an icy wind was blowing. But I saw that the roads had been cleared, and I decided that my best bet was to return to the settlement and get a horse. I had gone only a short distance when I saw a wagon coming toward me. Oh, ho there, ho, ho. Well, Paladin. Hey, old-timer. Lordy, man, I never figured to see you again till the spring thaw. Yeah? I was thinking you were stretched out stiff under that hunk of snow that come down off the mountain. As a matter of fact, I was, briefly. You were? Yeah. Oh. Mind if I climb up there with you? No, come on. All right. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Aaron, get one of them there blankets wrapped around you. Yeah. All right, this here's a real snapper. It sure is. Hey, where are you headed, old-timer? Beaver Park. Come on, get up. Yep. I'm the bearer of uh, pretty darn distant certain titans. Yeah? Yep. After the slide, we was all out there pulling around the snow looking for you. And out in the valley there, we come across Abe Muller. Rifle shot. Abe Muller? Yeah, that's Sid's brother. Well, three, four days ago, Franklin, that's another brother, started over from Beaver Park to pick up the remains. And had to wait till the road was clear, you see. Well, he never showed up. Because why? He was found this morning. Rifle shot? Yep. Looks like somebody's setting out to exterminate the Muller boys. Yep. Looks like a real blood feud. A blood feud? Hey, wait a minute. That old-timer, where were the Mullers located before they came to Montana? Well, they've always been kind of tight-mouthed about themselves, but I always figured it was Texas. Well, sure. Dolby County. Judge Oren Carr. Daniel I, Carr. I don't seem to follow you, Paladin. Judge Carr was an Easterner, appointed by the president to preside over the court in Dolby County, and the first case that came up before him was a murder charge against a man named Muller. Yeah? Now, he was found guilty, and Carr sentenced him to be hanged. The day the sentence was carried out, five men broke into the judge's house and strung him up by the neck from the rafters. What did they do to the varmints? Nothing. But everyone knew that the five lynchers were Muller's sons. You mean you think these here Mullers are the same ones? And as I recall, several months later, the oldest Muller boy was ambushed. Yeah, that must have been when the others left Dolby and came up here. Huh. Daniel Carr. Judge Carr's son, of course. The judge's son? What, what are you saying, Paladin? I'll explain later, old-timer. Let's get a move on. All right. Get up there. Come on. Come on, get Dandruff bothers most men, most women, too. So listen. Today, you can get rid of embarrassing dandruff in just three minutes. Yes, with Fitch Dandruff Remover Shampoo, unsightly dandruff's gone in three minutes. It's the quickest, easiest of all leading shampoos. That's not all. Using Fitch regularly is guaranteed to keep embarrassing dandruff away. Simply apply in the unique Fitch manner. Before you wet hair, rub in one minute. This way, Fitch Shampoo penetrates right down to the scalp. Next, add water. Lather one minute to wash every trace of dandruff out of your hair. Then rinse one minute. All that loosened dandruff goes down the drain. In three minutes with Fitch, 
One rubbing, one lathering, one rinsing, dandruff's gone. And never forget, Gentle Fitch can also leave your hair up to 35% brighter. To get rid of dandruff problems forever, brighten hair too. Use Fitch regularly. Get Fitch Dandruff Remover Shampoo today, only 59 cents. We didn't move quite fast enough. When we reached Beaver Fort, we found a crowd gathered around a blanket-wrapped body hanging over the back of a prospector's mule. It was Vernon Muller. He'd been ambushed. This here's a getting pretty scary, Paladin. I agree. Is Sid in this crowd here? Yeah, that's him over there in the red Mackinac. Oh. Sid Muller? Yeah, who are you? My name is Paladin. Paladin? Fine time for you to be showing up. Yeah, I know. You're too late to be of help to me. Uh, that's why I want to return this check to you. Here. Uh. Now, Sid, your brother Franklin was found this morning. Frank? He's been shot. He's dead. Frank, too. You hear that, man? Frank got it, too. I tell you, there ain't nobody safe while that crazy killer's running loose. Sid, the only life in danger now is yours. You better get to the sheriff and ask for protection till the man can be found and brought to justice. Justice? Look, Paladin, we'll see that he's brought to justice, just don't you worry. Fellas, the prospector that brought in Vernon here says there were some tracks out there in the snow. We gotta get us some hounds and go after that crazy killer. And when we get him, we sting him up. Come on, fellas! Them fellas is real worked up, Paladin. Yeah, I think maybe I know where Daniel's headed. I've got to get to him before that mob does. You're so all fired concerned about this fella, you'd think he was beholden to him. Old timer, I'm beholden to him for my life. Daniel? Daniel, let me in. You're working for Muller now, Paladin. This time my gun is pointed at you. I'm not working for Muller anymore. I want to talk to you, Daniel. I hope you don't mind. I'm going to keep my rifle on you. Go right ahead. Come in. Close the door. Daniel, they're coming for you. A crazy mob. Did Muller with them? Yeah. Good. I've been waiting to get to him. You can't stay here. I'm not going to move until I kill Sid Muller. Daniel, you're an intelligent man. What do you mean by this vendetta? Paladin, my father sat as a duly appointed judge. In the case of the state of Texas versus Lee Muller, he gave an honest and impartial judgment based on the laws of our land. So the Mullers took the law into their own hands and killed your father. Now you've taken the law into your hands to kill the Mullers. Where does it end? Doesn't matter. There's still time, Daniel. Give yourself up to the law. Tell your side of the story. No, Paladin, I have a job to do. Look, they're on their way. They're coming for you. I'm staying here. And don't interfere. Daniel, listen to me. Stay back. No. I won't pull this trigger, but I... Daniel, I... Sorry, Paladin. Paladin. Uh, hey, Paladin. Uh, oh, hello, old timer. Well, it's about time. You sure must have got yourself a good whack on the head. Hey, uh, hit me with a rifle butt. Nah, I thought you'd never come in two. Yeah, I... Uh... Hey, wait. The mob. Oh, they, they done their dirty work and gone already. What happened? Well, that bunch, uh, I was trailing along with them. We got to this here place, and then and this fella, well, nobody's expecting it. He just steps out big as life. Somehow, he got a bead on Sid, and just pointed his gun, took aim, and pulled the trigger. Sid just dropped. And then that crazy mob, they had the roof all ready, and they, they well, Paladin, it sure wasn't pretty. Daniel was determined to end it. And I couldn't stop him. Terrible waste, old timer. Munch, 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 Fritos, corn chips. 
And since Fritos corn chips are fresh as spring itself, it seemed appropriate to give you a springtime gift. So Fritos have attached a free package of flower seeds on their large bags as their salute to spring. There's nothing for you to mail in. Just buy a large bag of Fritos. And there, right on the bag, is your free package of flower seeds. They're the finest seeds you could get anywhere. Genuine burpee seeds. And there are three varieties. Beautiful zinnias, snapdragons, or petunias. Get yours, while they last, free flower seeds on the large bags of Fritos corn chips. Munch, munch, munch a bunch of Fritos corn chips. It's not polite to smack your lips, but you can't help it with Fritos corn chips. Munch, munch, munch a bunch of Fritos corn chips. Come in. Oh, hello, Miss Wong. Oh, we need to clean room, Mr. Parley Dancer. Oh, my. Uh, What's all this? Oh, uh, some clothing, Miss Wong, winter clothing. Oh. Hey, boy, is going to put it in my trunk in the basement. And then he's going to push the trunk away over in the corner. We won't be needing it again for a long time. Oh, is yes, that? Mais où sont les neiges d'antan? What's that, Monsieur Parleyden? Hmm? Oh, that François Villon is translated by Rossetti. But where are the snows of yesteryear? And I was just thinking. Oh, is that? <laughs> I don't care where are the snows of yesteryear. Mm. I don't care where are the snows of this year. I don't care where are the snows of next year. Only wherever they are, that's where I don't want to be. Lisa. Hello, I'm Burgess Meredith. Did you know there are over three million persons in America who are hard of hearing and not doing anything about it? Maybe you or some member of your family is hard of hearing. Well, fortunately, I've never had this problem. Some of my friends and family have. Well, a few years ago, your excuse might have been that you didn't want to wear a bulky hearing aid. But today, it's a different story. I've just seen the new Super 60 hearing glasses developed by Mako Electronics. If I hadn't known they were hearing glasses, I would have guessed them to be regular eyeglasses. It's a wonderful way for any hard-of-hearing person to conceal a hearing loss. There are styles for both men and women. For an interesting free booklet on hearing glasses for yourself or a friend, stop in at Mako or write to Hearing Glasses, CBS, 485 Madison Avenue, New York. Don't wait until your hearing gets worse. It may be too late. Send for your booklet today. Write CBS, 485 Madison Avenue, New York. Gun Will Travel. Created by Herb Meadow and Sam Rolfe, is produced and directed in Hollywood by Frank Paris and stars John Daner as Paladin, with Ben Wright as Hey Boy and Virginia Gregg as Miss Wong. Tonight's story was specially written for Have Gun Will Travel by Ann Dowd. Featured in the cast were Ralph Moody, Paul Dubov, and Barney Phillips. This is Hugh Douglas inviting you to join us again next week when CBS Radio presents. Have gun, will travel. You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash C slash G-A-R. Brought to you by G3PL.com. Kellogg's, the greatest name in cereals, presents... Wild Bill Hickok! Hey, 
you folks, hold on to your hats and gallop along with Guy Madison as Wild Bill Hickok and his pal Jingles, which is me, Andy Devine. We got another rootin' tootin' Wild Bill Hickok adventure story for you from the world's only talking cereal, Snap, Crackle, and Pop, Kellogg's Rice Krispies! Today, Kellogg's Rice Krispies brings you Wild Bill Hickok, transcribed in Hollywood and starring Guy Madison as Wild Bill and Andy Devine as his pal Jingles. In just 30 seconds, you'll hear the exciting story, Death at Sunset Trail. When you open your eyes in the morning, there's no finer thing in the world to look forward to than a big heaping bowl of golden crisp Kellogg's Rice Krispies, the talking cereal. These merry little gadabouts in the bowl will tell you with a snap, crackle, pop how fresh and crisp and good tasting they are. So get a big box tomorrow. And boys and girls, a little later on in the program, we'll tell you how you can get a wonderful Aerodoodle rocket launching beanie. So be sure to stay tuned in. The dangerous duties as United States Marshal led Wild Bill Hickok and his deputy Jingles from Kansas cow towns to the buttes of Wyoming in search of outlaws. But there were routine duties, too. One of these was to escort a mail stage from Cottonwood Springs to Bear River. It was easy enough to start with, but before they were through, there was excitement aplenty as they ran into Death at Sunset Trail. Now, Bill, this is what I call a real fine job. You like it, Jingle? I sure do. Just riding along nice and easy through pretty country. We're supposed to be guarding this stagecoach, partner. It's carrying mail, a box of gold, and a couple of passengers, remember? Sure, but it's a cinch, Bill. This is the life. Yeah, but you'd be howling like a coyote in a bear trap if you had to do it all the time. Oh, no, I wouldn't do no such a thing. That's right. Just be sure you don't go to sleep on the job. Me? Go to sleep? That's what I said. There might just be some road agents who'd like to get their hands on that gold box. Bill. Bill. Look coming down the hill. Yeah, partner. Now, you see what I mean? Three of them, Bill, wearing masks. They don't see us yet. Be ready. I'm ready. Doggone those varmints. They're liable to plumb ruin my vacation. All right, folks, none of you move. Driver, throw down the box. First one makes a play, dies in his tracks. Not so fast, mister. You're covered. Drop those guns. All three of you. Hickok, where'd you come from? Drop those guns. Yeah, you ain't robbing this stage. You two ain't stopping me. Feed them lead, boy. Two down, Bill. Yeah, but I'm left, and here's where you get yours, Hickok. You've got a chance to drop that six iron and live, mister. Not all your life, Bill! Too bad he asked for it, Bill. I only nicked him. Well, there's three more owl hoots that ain't riding the trail for a long time. <laughs> After they get patched up, they'll be guests of the territorial prison. That's right. Hello, uh, well, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Hickok, I would like to shake your hand. I'm Albert J. Morgan from Philadelphia. Howdy, Mr. Morgan. This is my partner, Jingles. Well, pleased to meet you, Mr. Morgan. <laughs> well, you're almost big enough for two partners, Jingles. Now, hold on there, mister. Oh, no offense, no offense at all. <laughs> as long as I'm to be a part of the West now, I want to make all the friends I can. You coming West to live, Mr. Morgan? Yes, Mr. Hickok. I have found the answer to all my dreams at last. Hmm, that's so? Uh, well, what are you dreaming about? Peace and quiet and security. Hmm. No more board of directors meetings, no more balance sheets to read, and no more worries. <laughs> I'm 76, gentlemen, and it's about time I had some fun out of life. Well, you come out here for peace and quiet, riding a bone jar and stagecoach, getting mixed up in holdups? Mister, you sure you ain't heading in the wrong direction? <laughs> Not at all. Here, here's the clipping from the Philadelphia paper. You read it yourself. Well, it says... Uh, what does it say, Bill? It says, to tired businessmen, oh. forget your troubles and stop worrying. <laughs> Spend the rest of your life at Sunset Trail in peace and quiet. Well, we take care of everything. 
Right to Big Ben Bogart at Bear River, Wyoming. And you wrote this, Jasper, a letter? I certainly did, Jingles. <laughs> I got it all arranged. Big Ben Bogart's meeting me when the stage gets to Bear River. He is, huh? Yes, sir. And he says I've got nothing to worry about for the rest of my life. Oh, oh well, by George, the stage is ready to go. <laughs> Bear River, here I come. Yep. Well, he's just kicking up his heels like a spring cold. <laughs> hey, Bill, Bill, what are you looking so thoughtful about? Come on, Jingles. Let's stay with the old gent till we get to Bear River. I want to know more about this plan Big Ben Bogart's got up his sleeve. Yeah, you know, come to think about it, it sounds too good to be true. That's just what I'm thinking, partner. All right, let's ride. Hi, Buckshot. Hi, boy. Jump, Joker, we're headed for Bear River. Ha, ha, ha! This is Charlie Lyon and Slim the Singing Cowboy, friends. Say, tell us about those wonderful new Aerodoodle beanie caps and rocket planes, Slim. Well, sir, they're just about the niftiest thing this side of the Rio Grande, Charlie. You know what a beanie is, kids. It's a cap. And this one's bright colored red and green. And it's got a four-inch flexible plastic launching tube on top for shooting out rocket planes. You fit one of these here rocket planes on the tube, then you blow through a 20-inch blasting tube, and that rocket plane can soar as high as a house. Boy, oh boy, what fun. Now, be the first in your neighborhood to get one. You just tear off the top of a regular or large-sized box of those delicious golden Kellogg's Rice Krispies and send it along with 25 cents to Kellogg's. They'll send you a swell rocket launching beanie with three rocket planes. So get Kellogg's Rice Krispies. That's the talking cereal that goes snap, crackle, and pop to tell you how fresh and crisp they are. Kellogg's Rice Krispies, Kellogg's Rice Krispies. Let's march right up to the table now. Rice Krispies taste the best and how. Snap, crackle, pop. Kellogg's Rice Krispies, Kellogg's Rice Krispies. Get this wonderful trick beanie that actually launches rocket planes. Send now to Kellogg's, Box 8500A, Chicago 77, Illinois. Kellogg's, Box 8500A, Chicago 77, Illinois. Okay, let's get back to Wild Bill Hickok. While Wild Bill Hickok and Jingles were riding with the stage toward Bear River, out at the ranch called Sunset Trail, Big Ben Bogard and one of his men was getting ready for the arrival of old A.J. Morgan. Uh, move that big chair over by the window, Buck, where it'll be in the sun. Yeah, Ben, so as the old weasel can be nice and comfortable, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's right. You're catching on, Buck. Well, I reckon I ought to catch on, at least by now, boss. This new one makes number nine you caught in your trap with that newspaper advertisement you run in Philadelphia. Thought I told you to forget about our other... Guess. You let something slip about them, and I'll put you up on the hill with them. Oh, now, Ben, you know I ain't gonna say nothing. Uh, what's the new sucker's name? Mr. A.J. Morgan, former president of Wilson, Todd, and Morgan Investment Brokers. Oh, rich, huh? Oh, the richest one so far. Come on, let's get the buckboard and go meet him. Stage ought to get to Bear River just about the time we do. You know, there's just one thing I don't understand. What's that? If these old mossy horns are smart enough to make so much money, how come they're dumb enough to fall for your scheme, boss? And there's two right good reasons for that, Buck. There is? Sure. First, there's no fool like an old fool. And second, Big Ben Bogart's got this thing figured as slick as a greased pig at the county fair. <laughs> saddles and say goodbye to Mr. Morgan, Bill. All right, partner. Yeah, stand there, Buckshot. Hey, there he is. Yeah. <laughs> sure stands out in this crowd of cowpokes and miners, don't he? Well, uh, Jingles and Mr. Hickok, I wanted to express my appreciation for a nice, safe trip. Oh, yes, and for the excitement, too. Well, I thought you'd come out here looking for peace and quiet. Oh, oh surely, but there's plenty of time for that at Sunset Trail. Pardon me, mister. 
Did I hear you mention Sunset Trail? I did. I, uh, oh, are you Mr. Bogart? Big Ben Bogart at your service. You must be Mr. Albert J. Morgan. I am. And these are my very good friends, Marshal Wild Bill Hickok and Jingles. Hickok? That's right, mister, and I'm the one he meant by Jingles. <laughs> Because that's my name. Howdy, Bogart. Well, howdy, Marshal Jingles. I didn't know you two were in Wyoming. We just rode in with the stage that brought Mr. Morgan. He told us about your plans for him. Yes, huh? Well, we've got some great plans for Mr. Morgan. Uh, Buck, come and get Mr. Morgan's luggage. Sure, boss. I'd like to hear a little bit more about those plans, Mr. Bogart. What for, Hickok? They don't concern you? No. But it all sounds very interesting, and Mr. Morgan's a friend of mine. Well, some other time. We've got to get Mr. Morgan back to the ranch at Sunset Trail right now. Alone. Alone? <laughs> Bill, all of a sudden, it looks like we aren't welcome out there. Never mind, Jingles. I wanted to drop over and have a talk with the sheriff anyway. What are you going to talk to the sheriff about, Hickok? Well, it might just be about a ranch where lawmen aren't welcome. The Jasper who runs such a ranch. I don't take that from you, Hickok. You, you got hey. a mighty touchy temper, hey. Bogart. Push in his face, Bill. I didn't like it from the start. In your face is going to get pushed in. I don't think so, Mr. Wait. All right, Bogart, get on your feet and take Mr. Morgan to your ranch, but handle him easy. Now, what do you mean by that? Just this. I'm coming out for a visit in a day or two, and I want to see him in the best of health. Understand? I don't know what you're getting at, Hickok, but I'm telling you this. Gents that go around meddling where it's none of their business sometimes don't come back. Well, Mr. Morgan, how do you like your sunset trail? It's all I expected and more too, Ben. Yes. This is the kind of place I've thought about for years while I sat at my desk in Philadelphia. Well, you know my agreement. You try it for a week or a month. Then if you like it, you make out your will to me. And the place is yours. And you agree to take care of me for the rest of my life. Run the ranch and shoulder all the worries. <laughs> That's it. Fair enough, isn't it? Oh, it's fine with me. I have no heirs, no family. All I want is peace and quiet. Well, take your time making up your mind. You're my guest, you know. Make yourself at home. I uh, thank you. Oh, by the way, Ben, have you seen anything of Wild Bill Hickok? No, why? Well, I've been here two days, and he said he was coming out to visit me. Oh, you ain't lost nothing if he don't show up. Maybe he forgot all about it. Boss! Hey, Ben, can I see you a minute? Sure, Buck, be right there. <laughs> oh, one more question about the deal, Ben. Yes? What's that, Mr. Morgan? Well, the way it's set up, if I die, everything goes to you. What if you should die first? Why, why it's all yours. But don't you go worrying about my dying first. Oh, well, I don't know. The way you pick fights with Wild Bill Hickok, it might just happen that I'd outlive you. <laughs> hey, boss, you coming? Yes, I'm coming. Hickok's not worrying me, Morgan. I'll outlive you both by a good margin. Hey, Bam. I just got back from town. What'd you find out? I heard Hickok and that big deputy of his talking to the sheriff. Hickok wanted to know whether you had had any other guests here at Sunset Trail. That's what. Boss, I don't like that star packer pushing his way around. Then why don't you do something about it, Buck? Huh? What do you mean, Ben? That oughtn't to be hard for you to figure out, Buck. You got a rifle. Hickok said he was coming out here. Yeah. I begin to see what you mean. Wouldn't surprise me if he was on his way out this afternoon. If a good man with a rifle sat on Lookout Rock just above the trail, he could plug two men easy without half trying. Yeah. He could plug two men easy, couldn't he? Without half trying. I'll see you later, boss. <laughs> You reckon Mr. Morgan's all right, Bill? He's all right if he hasn't signed that paper yet, Jingles. That the same one the others signed, Bill? That's right. Eight of them before Morgan. Well, I, I, I don't see what you're getting so all fired hot under the collar about. You said yourself the paper was clean and legal. Sure, the paper's legal, partner, but murder's not. Bill! 
Bill, that guy's trying to murder us, and we ain't got so much as a blade of grass to hide behind. Right for it, Jingles. A moving target's harder to hit. Hi, but so high. Jim Joker, run, boy. You're liable to be carrying an empty saddle. Oh, ho, ho. Hey, Wranglers. Kids all over the land are buzzing about the sensational new offer that Kellogg's Rice Krispies is making. Now, I'm going to tell you all about it in a minute. Right now, though, come on, let's everybody sing. Kellogg's Rice Krispies, Kellogg's Rice Krispies. Let's march right up to the table now. Rice Krispies taste the best, and how? Snap, crackle, pop. Kellogg's Rice Krispies, Kellogg's Rice Krispies. Here's what you can get from Kellogg's, kids. It's called the Aerodoodle Beanie Cap and Rocket Outfit. It's a bright red and green cap that fits on your head and has a flexible plastic four-inch tube attached to the top. You fit a sleek, sturdy five-and-a-half-inch rocket plane, and uh, there's three of them in the kit, on the front of this here tube. Now you blow through another long tube and watch the rocket go zooming off your cap and zip up into the air. You'll have all kinds of fun with it, and I'll tell you how you can get this wonderful rocket beanie outfit. Just send the box top from a package of Kellogg's Rice Krispies along with 25 cents to Kellogg's, Box 8500A, Chicago 77, Illinois. Now be sure to include your name and address. That's Kellogg's, Box 8500A, Chicago 77, Illinois. You better send it right away. And now what do you say? Let's get back to Wild Bill Hickok. <laughs> Wild Bill Hickok and Jingles, on their way to Sunset Trail Ranch to visit old Mr. Morgan, were ambushed by an unseen gunman and had to make a run for it. Come on, Joker! Just a little more, Jingles, and we'll be out of his range. That can't come too soon for me! Oh, watch out. Who are I? Hold up, Jingles! Oh, oh, Joker. You sure we're out of range, Bill? Must be. Stop shooting. Now, who do you think that could have been? Just offhand, I'd say it was either Bogart or one of his men. But why why would he want to go dusting the cuckleburrs out of my hair with a rifle slug for? Maybe he doesn't like the way you comb it, partner. Oh, now, Bill, you know I ain't combed my hair all day. Well, what are we going to do now? I'd kind of like to head up that hill and smoke that bushwhacker out in the open, but I figure we got more urgent business. Yeah? Like what? A social visit to Mr. Morgan at the Sunset Trail Ranch. Come on, it's not much further. Let's go, Buckshot. Come on. Hi. Well, I ain't been hankering for the visit, but if you're set on it, I reckon I gotta go, too. Get along, Joker! Ho, ho, ho! Boss! Boss! Oh, you jughead. Hold down. Boss! We gotta do something fast. Well, what's chasing you, Buck? While Bill Hickok and that big deputy of his... I missed them. You lame brain dodo. How could you miss them? Well, they they outran my bullets. Now, I swear it. I seen them. Where's the old man? Around front of the house. Well, Hickok will be here any minute. What are we going to do? You ain't going to do nothing but go hide out and keep your trap shut. I'll take care of this my way. Okay, Ben. Anything you say. And don't show your face till I come looking for no, you. I won't. I want no part of that Hickok. <laughs> Well, hello, Ben. I was just enjoying the scenery. This hammock you put up for me is the answer to all my prayers. Well, hell, that's fine, Mr. Morgan. Glad you liked the place. <laughs> like it? Why, I wouldn't leave here in anything but a pine box. Well, then, maybe you'd better come in the house and sign your new will right now before you change your mind. I've got it right here in my pocket. Yeah. It's all made out and ready for you. Oh, well, let me see it here. Here it's your yes. Oh, yes, well, it's, it's set up just as you outlined it all right. Sure, all neat and legal, like I said. You leave everything to me when you die, I sign over to the ranch to you now and agree to take care of you the rest of your life. And if you die first, I get it all. You still worrying about me kicking up my heels first, huh? Well, don't lose no sleep over that. <laughs> don't worry, I won't. <laughs> but I'm in no hurry. Oh, yes, you are. What's that? You're going in the house and sign that will right now. Come on. <laughs> oh, God, turn me loose. What are you doing? I got no more time to fool with you. No, 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 wait. Wait, nothing. There. 
There's a pen and ink on the desk. Sign it. Yes, but I'm not ready to sign that will yet. Stop stalling. I ain't going to wait all day. Uh, well, well, all right. All right. We, we both have to sign it, I believe. Uh, so suppose you sign it first, Bogart. Sure, sure. What's the difference? There you are. That's right. Now, my signature goes just below yours, I believe. Yeah, you know it does. Now, sign it quick. Don't sign that paper, Morgan. Me, I had no intention of signing, Mr. Hickok, but I thought you'd never get here. What do you mean by that, Morgan? <laughs> We'd have been here sooner, but we were delayed a bit down the road. Well, thank goodness you got here when you did, Bill. This man Bogard's a swindler. That's a lie. These papers are legal. Sure they are. But Bogard's more than a swindler, Mr. Morgan. Huh? What do you mean, Bill? If Morgan had signed that will, he'd have been signing his death warrant at the same time. My, my death warrant? That's right. The sheriff told me there had been eight other owners of this Sunset Trail Ranch in the last five months. Eight others? Well, where are they? You might ask Bogart that question. Well, they, uh, they died. I took care of them until they did. For the rest of their lives. Like this will reads. Sure. Just like it says. Say, what's going on here? I don't think they lasted long after they signed their wills, Bogart. I ain't listening to no more of this hiccup. You found proof for your accusations, Bill? Bill, you mean Bogart got them eight old men to sign wills, leaving him everything, and then killed them? That's my guess, partner. Hmm. You keep an eye on Bogart while I go look around for eight graves. You ain't gonna find no graves but your own hiccup. Mr. Hiccup, hiccup! Billy's wrong! Well, mister, it's just a good thing Bill don't like killing people, or you would be in your grave from that bonehead play. Uh... Hey, Bill, there's the other one. No, no, don't shoot, don't shoot. I give up. Well, that's better. Now drop that six gun. Now both of you varmints back up against that wall till we're good and ready to take you to jail. Nice work, Jingles. So Bogart was going to make corpse number nine out of me, huh? Oh, man. Give me one of your guns, Bill. Hey, wait a minute. Oh, what are you up to, Mr. Morgan? I'm going to show this low-down, bloodthirsty rapscallion which one of us is going to live the longest round here. No, no, don't let him shoot me. Hold it, Morgan. The law will take care of Bogard. You better return my gun just the way it is. No, no let me shoot him, Bill. Oh, he sure <laughs> got pepper in his gizzard, ain't he, Bill? Hmm. Almost too much, partner. Hey, Mr. Morgan... Ain't you the gent who came west looking for peace and quiet for the rest of your life? Well, sure I did, Jingles. Why? Well, from the way you take the gun smoking action, looks to me like you're going to have to come and ride the trail with Wild Bill and me just to get enough excitement to keep you from going to seed. <laughs> And now, here are the stars of Wild Bill Hickok, Guy Madison and Andy Devine. Thanks for being with us, folks. Andy and I will be back again with you on Monday. Yes, sirree. And we've got another Wild Bill Hickok story for you, all about a little Western newspaper in plenty of trouble. We call it Press for Justice. Meanwhile, Andy and I hope you'll remember to get Kellogg's Rice Krispies. Right. It's the world's only talking cereal. You bet it is. Andy and I think Kellogg's Rice Krispies are great. So long. See you Monday. <laughs> yes, sir. Kellogg's, the greatest name in cereals, has brought you another exciting story of Wild Bill Hickok, starring Guy Madison and Andy Devine in person. Today's cast included Ken Christie, Fred Shields, and Howard McNear. Our director is Paul Pierce. Music by Dick Orant. Story by Larry Hayes. This is a David Heyer production transcribed in Hollywood. Don't forget to listen Monday, same time, same station, when Wild Bill Hickok stands up for the press for justice. Now, this is Charlie Lyon speaking for Kellogg's Rice Krispies, the world's only talking cereal. Kellogg's Corn Flakes, America's favorite ready-to-eat cereal. And Kellogg's Sugar Corn Pops, the cereal with the sweetening already on it. You.
You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash C slash G-A-R. Brought to you by G3PL.com. Wheaties presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. On stage tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another in the Wheaties big parade of exciting half-hour presentations. <laughs> Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. From the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Tonight's case, The Broken Spur. Saturday night, June 5th, 1948. The time, 10 p.m., on a small ranch 10 miles south of Cranston, Irwin County, Texas, Milton Thomas was counting a large sum of money, preparatory to locking it up for the night. As he was counting, his dog, Rags, appeared to be nervous. Thomas tried to quiet him. Rags, stop that. You're making me count wrong. Fifty-one hundred... Uh, oh, 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 oh. What did Sam Hill the matter with you tonight? Now stop it. Uh, quiet, Rags. Down, down, down. Who's there? Casey. What do you want, Casey? I want to talk to you. Mm, it seems to me it's awfully that nice to be knocking at people's doors. Now, if it's about that long... All right, long, get back in the room. That, that gun, what are you trying to... Get your dog back or off. Back. Get back or you'll get the same thing. Back. Get away from that dog. Give me that money. No, no, I won't. Oh, don't you ask for it. No, 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 don't take it. Shut up, me. shut up. Let go of my legs. No. I said let go. No. All right, then. Tales of the Texas Rangers will continue in just a moment. If you've got a job to do tomorrow, partner, get your Wheaties. Sure, Breakfast of Champions is for you. Just like it's for Ralph Kiner, pride of the Pittsburgh Pirates. You may not play ball for a living... But whatever your job is tomorrow, you can do it better on a better breakfast. And it's a better breakfast you're starting with Wheaties. There's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake. Yes, whole wheat. Good, sound, whole wheat. Plump and ripe and bursting with vitamins and minerals and protein for your vitality, your energy, your working power. So tumble the Wheaties out of the package, pour on the milk, put on the fruit, pick up the spoon, and smile. You're eating good to be feeling good. Breakfast of champions for people who are going places. Are you ready? Try them. See how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. At 10.30 the same night, Milton Thomas's house was discovered on fire. The Cranston Fire Department was called. Next morning, the local sheriff, making a routine investigation, discovered the burnt remains of a broken chair next to Thomas's body. He ordered an autopsy. The results prompted him to call the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned to the case and arrived at the scene of the fire early that afternoon. Well, howdy, Ranger. I'm Sheriff Tax. Howdy. My name's Jace Pearson. Come on, I'll show you the house. Or what's left of it. All right, folks, step back, please. Shouldn't have all these people walking around here, Sheriff, ruin any footprints there might be. I had my deputy here just a few minutes ago, Pearson. I sent him down to get some coffee. All right, folks, step back away from the house, all of you. Now get back to the fence, please. All burned out except for the wall, but you may find something. You said when you called you didn't think it was an accident. I've been sheriff here for 18 years, and I'll stake my reputation it wasn't. 
It was arson to cover murder. Base that on the autopsy? Yep. Coroner couldn't find any traces of carbon granules in the bronchial pastures or lungs. And only the normal amount of carbon monoxide in the lungs. Indicating Milk Thomas wasn't breathing when the fire started. Right. This was the front door. Burned off the hinges and fell out. That's funny. What? The lock on this door. Special kind. Takes a key on both sides. When the door is shut, you have to have a key to get out of the house as well as in. Oh, that, yeah. Milk was a funny old galoot. Had them put on both doors. The windows had trick locks, too. Why? Well, folks say he kept a lot of money in the house. Maybe just a story. Hmm. This lock's still working. Let's look at the back door. Oh, here's what's left of Mill's old iron safe. Was it open like that when you found it? Yep. Empty, too. This lock's not forced or broken. Kind of hard to tell much about anything after the roof fell in. Yeah, it's a mess, all right. Same kind of lock here on the back door. It's working, too. Meaning whoever started the fire was locked in? Well, look here. Whoever it was, here's where he went out. See that window glass outside on the ground? Let's climb out and look. See? The heat didn't break it. It's not crazed. It was knocked out from inside. And do you think the killer was trapped inside? Could have been, after he set fire to the place. How about footprints, Sheriff? Oh, there's thousands of them. Volunteer firemen tramping around all during the fire. Wait. Wait, here's something. Hmm. Looks like a spur row. That's exactly what it is. Broken off a spur. Right below where the window was. Maybe busted off by a man jumping out the window with his tail feathers on fire? Maybe. I don't envy you none, Pearson. How come? Well, as a clue, the spur roll's probably mighty important. But but what, Sheriff? I was just thinking. There probably ain't over 10 million spurs in the state of Texas with rowels just like the one you got there in your hand. <laughs> well, your figure may be a little high, Sheriff, but I get your point. <laughs> hey, Jack. Me? Yeah, what do you think you're doing, Jack? Well, what's the matter, Sheriff? You know darn well what's the matter. I told you to keep back. I was just looking around. Well, stop kicking around those ashes. And the rest of you. That's evidence you're tramping on. We didn't mean no harm. Now listen, all of you. It's the last time I'm going to tell you. How'd you like it if we thought one of you was the criminal coming back to the scene of the crime and deliberately trying to destroy evidence? Oh. Okay, then. Get back or get off the property altogether. Uh, books say that's generally not true, Sheriff. Huh? About the criminal in the scene of the crime. Happens only once in a thousand times. Oh, I know it. I just want to throw a scare into him. I see. Oh, by the way, who was that fellow you were talking to? Him? His name's Casey. Jack Casey. <laughs> The sheriff and I went over the yard thoroughly, but any footprints the murderer might have left were trampled out by the firemen and the onlookers. Finally, some distance from the house, I found the place I was looking for. Sheriff? Huh? Come over here. What is it? Look, here's where he took off from. Mm, footprints. Dug out in an awful hurry, too. And his horse tethered to this tree. Seems to me any man who had legitimate business at the house would have tied up closer. Yeah, that's logical. Well, look here. Horse chewed on the tree. It might be a cribber. We find our man, we'll likely find a horse that chews on his feed bin. See, these tracks head west toward Snake Creek. You got a horse, Sheriff? I can get one. Good. I'll get mine out of the trailer. We're going to follow those hoof prints. Hold it, Sheriff. Keep your horse off that bank. Why? Why? What's the matter? Boot prints. Good, fresh ones. Oh, I thought for a minute you'd seen a moccasin. This stream's full of cotton mouths. Yeah. I'll take my kit and make some plaster molds of these prints. And he dismounted here and led his horse across. Yeah, probably afraid of slipping on those flat, mossy rocks. Hmm. Small foot, about size seven or eight, I'd say. Odd track pattern, too. 
Not likely he was toting a heavy load. Probably a fat man. Fat? Yeah, look at his tracks. Deep, even in the dry places. I make tracks as deep as those, way over 200, but I ain't exactly fat. No, you're not fat, Sheriff. But what size boot do you wear? Eleven and a half. Do you ever see a man your height make a footprint this small? Well, come to think of it, I don't suppose they ever did. Now, wait a minute. That man who was poking around the ashes back at the house. Casey, was it? Yeah, Jack Casey. What about him? He's fat. Sheriff, was he driving a car or riding? Casey was riding his old paint mare. Say, she's a cribber. Then I'm going to need a warrant. As soon as I get this mold, I'm heading for town. Sheriff, either the books are wrong, or this Casey is one in a thousand. Operator. Operator, this is Jack Casey again. What about that call I've been trying to get through for the last hour and a half? Yeah, Moni, Texas, the Delta Sawmill Company. I know it's Sunday, but somebody's bound to be... Who's that? Oh, Jack! What are you doing with that gun? Oh. oh, it's you. Operator. Hello, operator. Hey, you said you'd call me back every 20 minutes. It was over a half hour last time. Well, keep trying. Jack, who are you trying to call? And what are you doing with your shotgun? Leave me alone, Martha. Where you been since noon? You were supposed to meet me at the Tate's for dinner. I know it, I know it, but... I... Who's that? Who is it? Texas Ranger. What? Jack, what have you done? Put that gun away. Get in the back room. You ain't fixing to shoot him, are you? If I have to. Oh, Jack, don't do it. Please, uh, Jack, don't be... Oh. Hold it, Ranger. Stay where you are. Put that gun down, Casey. You're not coming in here. I got a warrant here that says I can. And I am. Jack, put it down. Let go of that barrel. Grab no. me, Ranger. Give me that. You all right, ma'am? Yeah. Yeah, I'm all right. Shotgun's a nasty thing to carry around cocked. I'll just oh. take this. I want to look around a little. That's your bedroom? Yeah. Come on. Paint mare outside yours? Yes, it is. Are these your boots? Mm-hmm. How'd you break this spur? Huh? Well, I didn't know it was broken. I'll take these boots along. You want me to get it, Jack? No. Is somebody going to answer it? Yeah. yeah, sure. Hello? What? Well, never mind. Cancel it. You better come along with me, Casey. What's this all about, Ranger? Where are you taking Jack? He thinks somebody killed Milk Thomas. To be exact, he thinks I did. No! You seem to know some of the answers. Some of them. Before we go, Ranger, I'd like to ask you one question. Sure. What time did this so-called murder take place? About 10 o'clock last night. 10 o'clock? Well, that's I'll when we handle were... this, Martin. Suppose I can prove where I was last night. We're just as anxious to prove a man innocent as guilty, Casey. Do you have any witnesses? About 300 of them. At 10 o'clock last night, I was sitting in the Cranston High School Auditorium watching my niece graduate. In just a moment, we continue with Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. If a man rides herd on a hundred head of cattle all day, first he needs his Wheaties. Yes, and if a man sits behind a big desk and pushes buttons on his job, first he needs his Wheaties. And listen, Mama, you too. If you keep track of a couple of growing up kids and wash dishes and make beds on your job, first you need your Wheaties. Yup, whatever your job, wherever you work, Wheaties can help. Whether you run a machine or pound a typewriter or play baseball for a living, first you need your Wheaties. Because here is whole wheat with the rich, full-bodied energy of whole wheat. There's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake. That's why Wheaties give so much. Vitamins, minerals, protein. Wheaties have them, and they're for you. Pour the Wheaties into the cereal bowl, add the milk, add the fruit, and dig right in. Do that at 7.00. 
and see how much better you're working when 11 a.m. rolls around. Yes, try them every morning, crisp and tempting, and see if I'm not right. See if a better breakfast with the whole wheat nourishment of Wheaties doesn't make a pleasant difference in your morning's work. See if milk, fruit, Wheaties isn't honest and truly breakfast of champions. See yourself how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. Casey stuck to the alibi that he'd been at the graduation the night before, but I already had enough evidence to take him in. While the sheriff was out asking questions around town, I tried to break down Casey's story. I tell you I was there. All right, take it easy, Casey. Let's assume for a minute you were. And how do you count for the boot prints made by your boots and found near the scene of the crime? Lots of people wear boots. Could have been anybody. I'm afraid not. You see, I made plaster casts of those prints, and the boots, the ones you admitted were yours, matched the prints to the last nail mark. I... Well, I've tramped around this part of the country a lot of times. They could have been old prints. Uh Uh-uh. These were fresh prints. Well, what about it? I... I don't know. All right, then. What about the rowel we found just outside Thomas' house? One broken off your spur. I don't know anything about that either. There's no point in withholding information, Casey. You know we'll find out about it sooner or later. Well, how you doing, Pearson? Casey decided to come clean? Not yet. What about the niece, Sheriff? The neighbors say she and her family left on a vacation early this morning. You know anything about that, Casey? No. Too bad. Because I've had several interesting chats. Casey, I've just talked to four people who were at the graduation exercises last night. Four people who know you, and not one of them remembers seeing you there. I was at the high school last night, I tell you. Casey, the sheriff's talked to four people who didn't see you. Well, who did? I don't know. It was dark in the auditorium. Didn't you speak to anybody? No. I think it already started. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah. I talked to one of the ushers. What was his name? Wasn't a him, it was a her. One of the high school girls. She's wearing a long pink dress. Uh, Sheriff, who's the principal of the high school? Mr. Schott. Warren Schott. All right, lock Casey up. I'm going to find out who the ushers were, and especially the little girl with the long pink dress. Why, why, yes, sir. I I remember Mr. Casey being there. With Mrs. Casey. Are you sure, Ella May? This is very important. Well, sure, I'm sure. They came in late and had to wait until the invocation was over. And then he asked for an aisle seat. He said he couldn't climb over people. He's so... <laughs> well, you know. Yeah, I know. And he didn't leave at any time during the exercises. Mm, not until near the end. They left just before the recessional while everybody was standing and singing the class song. What time was that? Oh... A few minutes before 11. All right. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Was I any help, Ranger? Yes, Ella May. You were a big help. I was stuck. It looked like I was going to have to release Casey. Then I remembered something. The phone call that came in while I was out at Casey's place. The one he'd been reluctant to answer. I dropped by the Cranston telephone office. This is the call you wanted, Ranger. What was it? Mr. Jack Casey placed a call to the Delta Sawmill Company in Moni, Texas at 2.22 p.m. today. There was no answer, and when the Moni operator did get through, she called back at 3.40. But Mr. Casey had canceled it. Do you know who the call was for? Oh, yes, sir. It was person to person to Mr. Ben Casey. Ben Casey? Mr. Jack Casey's son. Son? Well, do you know him? I used to. When? Well, we went to high school together. Some of my girlfriends and I used to go places with Ben's bunch, but my mother made me stop. She said he wasn't the kind of boy that girls should run around with. I see. And he finally left home. Couldn't get along with his stepmother. Oh, then Mrs. Casey's not his mother. Oh, no, Ranger. They used to fight. Oh. Go on. This may be very important. Well, I heard that she and Ben fought all the time, and then one day after they had a big fight, Ben packed up and left. Well, when was this? Mm, I reckon it was a couple of years ago. He went down to Moni then and got a job at that sawmill there. What does this Ben look like? 
He's a spitting image of his father and just as fat, too. Have you seen him lately? I saw him at the bus station. His father came and picked him up. When? Let's see, um, day before yesterday. Friday. There was no doubt now why Jack Casey wasn't talking. He was protecting his own son. I put a call through to Mrs. Casey and met her at the sheriff's office. I ain't saying this because he ain't my flesh and blood, Ranger, but Ben's bad through and through. I might have known he was the one killed Milt Thomas. Uh, Mrs. Casey, tell me about Ben. He came in Friday, didn't he? Yeah. Come in on the bus and stayed over Saturday. He wanted to borrow money. He's always broke. Gambles. That's right, Pearson. Picked him up a couple of times for gambling. Go on, Miss Casey. Well, like I say, he wanted to borrow $50 from Jack, but Jack didn't have it. He just paid off a note to Milt Thomas, and he was kind of strapped. Oh, your husband owed Thomas money? Yes, but it was the last payment. Jack was joking about how Thomas always wanted cash money. Didn't trust checks. Did Ben hear him say this? He sure did, Sheriff. And then he sucked around all day Saturday until we was getting ready to go to the commencement that night. And just before we left... He said he was going to use Jack's horse to go for a ride. At night? Yeah, seems strange to me, too. And then he asked, could he borrow a pair of Jack's boots? He was wearing flat heel shoes. Uh, they were the same size? Oh, have, ever since I can remember. Well, anyway, we went on to the graduation. And when we got home, the mare was in the barn, still saddled, all sweaty. Looked like she'd been run almost to death. And Jack's boots were tossed on the floor, and Ben was gone. All right, Miss Casey. That's all for now, and thanks. You're welcome. Come on, Sheriff. We're going on a little trip. <laughs> Sheriff Taxon and I piled into my car and headed for Moni. As soon as we got out on the highway, I put in a call to my headquarters. Unit 10 to KTXA. Unit 10 to KTXA. KTXA to Unit 10. Go ahead, Unit 10. Unit 10 leaving Cranston State Highway 22 en route to Moni. Investigating murder suspect believed in vicinity of Delta Sawmill. We'll keep KTXA informed. Unit 10, 10 4. Okay. KTXA, Austin. KTXA, Sheriff, Austin, the unit you know young Casey by sight, don't you? I uh, watched him grow up. Good. If he's gone and we have to comb for him, I don't want to turn up the wrong fat man again. Oh, you'd know him now, after seeing his father. Except for age, they're the same. You mean except for age and the fact that the young one's a murderer. When we reached the sawmill, the moon was up. A full moon. There was a light burning through the window of one shack at the edge of the camp. We pulled up there and got out of the car and went in. Well, howdy, Ranger. Sure. All right. We're looking for a man named Casey. Ben Casey? Yeah, here I am. I don't know for sure. Sleeps in the big bunkhouse down the line. Which bunk? I'll show you if you like. Fine. Sheriff, maybe you better take a look through the mess hall. That boy like him might be fixing a late snack. If you don't find him, come up and meet me. And if you do find him, call me before you try and take him. Right. The bunkhouse is this way. No, no light in the place. Well, some of the boys was going into town for a moonlight dance. Don't know if Ben went with them or not. Has he been packing any money that you know of? Well, well, yeah, come to think of it, he had quite a bit. Said he hit it lucky in a dice game that... Well, he did get it in a dice game, didn't he? If he did, the other fellow never got a chance to roll them. Oh? Well, here we are. I'll light this lamp for you. Uh, uh, ben sleeps in that third bunk on the right. Thanks. I'll wait for him. All right, I'll get back to my books and just entering a shipment that's being hauled out tonight. That's why you found me working. Go ahead. But uh, if you see Casey, don't mention I'm here. The foreman went back to his shack and I ripped Ben Casey's bunk apart. There was nothing in the bunk of the covering. I dragged a footlocker out from underneath and was bending over it. Come when... on, Ranger. Up with it. Don't turn around. They're up. 
What are you doing here? If you're Ben Casey, you know what I'm doing. This is the end of the road, boy. I'll take that lantern. I'd be careful with that, Ben. Remember what happened the last time you dropped a lantern? You're pretty smart, ain't you, mister? But I'm smart, too. Here's a present for you. The lantern hit the edge of the bunk and the flaming kerosene splashed over me. I beat the flames out with my hands and dove for the door. He'd rammed something against the outside of it. When I forced it open, I stumbled over a heavy log bench he'd used as a barricade. Hey, Ranger, what is it? Casey, you see him, Sheriff? Well, somebody went off that way. Heard the rail siding. Let's go. We spotted him swinging up the side of a flat car as the train hit the main line and started to roll. We grabbed onto one of the last cars and scrambled to the top and started to work our way forward. There he is. About five cars ahead. I can't see him. Kerosene scorched my eyes. He can see us, all right. He's shooting. Drop flat. We'll crawl up on him. He can't go any farther than the length of the train. There he goes. He's jumping. I see him. I'm going after him. Well, I'm coming with you. He's breaking through the wheel. Can you see him? No, but he's close. About ten yards in, not moving. Keep low. We're silhouetted good against this clearing. What you doing, Pearson? Taking off my jacket. See if you can find a stick about five feet long. Well, here's a dead branch. This do? Fine. Give it to me. What are you fixing to do? I'm going to put this branch through my coat sleeves like this. Here. When I tell you, hold it up. I get it. Something for him to shoot at. Huh? Right. I'll fire at his gun flash. All right, Casey, come out with your hands up. This is your last chance, Casey. Okay, Sheriff, lift the coat. Yeah. You got him! Come on! Don't shoot, Ray. Don't kill me. Oh, please, please, give me a chance. Like you gave Milt Thomas? It was a short train ride, Casey, but I got a hunch you'll get a longer one soon. Come on. Ben Casey confessed to the murder of Milt Thomas. On August 2nd, 1948, he entered Huntsville Penitentiary. His sentence, life imprisonment. Joe McRae, that was a great show tonight. Wheaties and I are proud of you. Thank you, Frank. I like to please the customers. Well, now, so do I. Take Wheaties, for instance. Frank... Are you going to say that Wheaties taste good? Well, yes, I was going to touch on that. And are you going to say that Wheaties are good for people? Yes, yes, I was going to say just that. Anything else? Well, no, I guess that just about covers it, Joel. Except, uh... Except telling people to get some. That's it, how'd you know? Well, that's easy, Frank. I'm a Wheaties eater myself. You hear that, folks? You, too, can be a Wheaties eater. As early as tomorrow morning. Breakfast of champions, you know. Get some. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. This story was transcribed and adapted by David Bruce and was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. And this is the Wheaties man, Frank Martin, inviting you to listen Monday night to Frank Lovejoy and Nightbeat on the Wheaties Big Parade. See you then. Tomorrow, there's good listening with the Summer Symphony on NBC. You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash C slash G-A-R. Brought to you by G3PL.com. Ladies and gentlemen, due to technical difficulties beyond our control at the moment, the Dragnet program originally scheduled at this period has been postponed temporarily. It will be heard in just a few moments.
partners at J. Boss's, boss's Captain, Captain Steve. Steve. My name, my name's Friday. Friday. We were on the way, on the way out, out from the office. office. It was 10.38 a.m. when we got to Paris Avenue. Number 213. Yes? How do you do, Miss Wagner? Police officers, I'm Sergeant Jacobs. This is my partner, Sergeant Friday. Oh, yes, Sergeant. I've been expecting you. Would you come in, please? Thank you very much. Thank you. Hope you'll excuse the way the house looks, officers, right in the middle of packing, getting ready to move. I understand. I'll try not to keep you, Miss Wagner. So much to do, making arrangements for Dorothy's funeral, the undertaker. Then all this moving business on top of it. I couldn't bear to stay here any longer, though. Yes, ma'am, we understand. We'll make it as brief as we can. I'd like to have you tell us about this trouble that your sister had as much as you know about it, I mean. Plain out-and-out murder, in my opinion. Might just as well have taken a gun and killed her, no difference. You knew all about the relationship between your sister Dorothy and this man Reynolds, is that correct? Yes, right from the beginning. I was there when they met. Would you mind if I went ahead packing these few things here? My sister's things. I'd like to finish up before I leave. Have an appointment at noon, the mortuary. Surely, go right ahead. A few books, knickknacks, personal things of Dorothy's. Foolish woman, I gave her credit for more sense. Now, about this man Reynolds, Miss Wagner. I saw through him right from the start. I tried to tell Dorothy. He was a fortune hunter, money hungry. Of course, she wouldn't listen. She always knew better. Charles R. Reynolds, is that the name you knew him by, ma'am? Yes, that's right. Dorothy and I met him one Sunday night in the hotel dining room. Two of us always had dinner at the hotel Sunday nights every Sunday. That's the hotel out in Wiltshire you told us about? That's correct. Be exactly a month this coming Sunday. Came up to our table and introduced himself. Claimed he knew my father when he was alive. Dad owned some big packing plants in the east. Died nine years ago. Left the estate to Dorothy and me. I see. Would you have anything to add to the description that you gave us on Reynolds, Miss Wagner? I mean, can you think of anything unusual about him at all? Scars, peculiar mannerisms, anything like that? No, nothing special. Dressed well, as I say. Apparently cultured, well-traveled. Mm-hmm. He was handsome enough. Attractive. I knew it was only after our money, though, playing up to Dorothy that way, kissing her hand, taking her out all the time. Probably would have tried the same thing with me. It's lucky I knew better. How did you after the first meeting with him, Miss Wagner? Did you start dating your sister Dorothy right away? Yes, the next night. Called here at our home and asked Dorothy to the theater. I think he was going to ask me, but he was too smart for that. I knew him for what he was. Hmm. Imagine that. Poem Miss Dorothy wrote in high school. Love poems. Silly. She never did get it out of her head. You and your sister lived alone here in the house, did you, ma'am? Yes, Dorothy and I and the maid. I don't want to stay here after what's happened, though. I'm going to my cousin's in Vermont. Never want to see this place again. Yes, ma'am, I can understand. How soon after you met Reynolds did he marry your sister? A little over two weeks. He'd been seeing her almost every night, taking her out dancing to the theaters, big dinners, bringing her home late. They'd sit here in the living room. I could hear them from my bedroom upstairs laughing, him telling her how beautiful she was. 42-year-old woman, imagine that. You're about the same age your sister was? Just about. A little older. People always took us for twins, though. Here's a snapshot of me taken in my 20s boy with me there, he wanted to marry me. My money, of course, that's all he wanted. Too bad. Dorothy never seemed to realize that about men. Girls from wealthy families, they have to be careful. We understand Reynolds took your sister out of town to be married, is that right? Yes, Las Vegas. Reynolds had told her his bank funds were tied up temporarily in a Canadian bank. He wrote Dorothy a check for $10,000, and she gave him her check for the same amount. He said he wanted to book reservations for a round-the-world trip for both of them. I see. The same day Dorothy gave him the check, he cashed it. The bank called her about it, and she said it was perfectly all right. An hour after he cashed it, Reynolds disappeared. No trace of him. Of course, his check's worthless. We found that out. Mm Mm-hmm. And you figure that's the only reason your sister took her own life? There's no other reason. Wasn't the money so much. Dorothy has her share of the estate. It's a shame, I suppose. Awful shame. Disappointment. She should have known better a woman her age. Had your sister ever been married before, Miss Wagner? Yes, when she was 18. Ran off to Chicago and married a young fellow. She claimed she loved him, too. Naturally, he was after our money. My father and I went and brought her home. We had the marriage annulled. It was that way all her life. Half a dozen men. They brought Dorothy nothing but misery. 
And this was the last. This Charles Reynolds. How about his background, ma'am, his business connections? He ever mention any of that to you or your sister? Claimed he had interests all over. South America, Australia. Seemed to have plenty of money. Guess his kind always has. Do you think you'll find him? We're going to try, Miss Wagner. Dorothy went upstairs to her bedroom and stayed there. She looks so strange. She took out some pressed flowers from a book. Some boy had given them to her once years ago. Don't know who. She just sat on the edge of her bed and stared at them, old pressed flowers. Next morning, the maid came upstairs and Dorothy was lying on the floor. Empty bottle of pills next to her. Awful disgrace. Never happened before in our family. Mm -hmm. If you don't mind, Miss Wagner, we'd like to get as many particulars about this man Reynolds as you can remember. There, that's the last. I don't know what else to tell you, officer. All I know is I was young when Dorothy was young. I could have had a man if I wanted. But I didn't run off when I was 18 to marry a boy. I knew my duty. It wasn't proper. It wasn't love. I didn't run off as a middle-aged woman to marry a fortune hunter either. What made her do it? I wouldn't know, ma'am. She was your sister. What kind of a man was he? What kind of a mind? Making love, kissing her, just to take her money. Imagine. Selling somebody with a kiss. Well, it's not the first time, ma'am. Is that so? Look it up. You'll find it in the Bible. Eleven eighteen a.m. We continued to interview the victim's sister for another 40 minutes, and then we left the Wagner home, drove back to the office, and continued our investigation of the suspect, Charles R. Reynolds. As far as we were concerned, the criminal was new to us, but the crime wasn't. The marriage racket's as old as any con game on earth, and as con games go, it's one of the lowest. It trades on one of the most natural and normal instincts a man or a woman has, a desire for companionship, a home, and a family. And for the sake of an easy dollar, it betrays the victim and the instinct ruthlessly, regardless of the consequences. In the case of 42-year-old heiress Dorothy Wagner, the disappointment was too much to cope with. For her, the marriage game ended in the front parlor of a mortuary on South Hoover Street. For the suspect, Charles Reynolds, it had continued to be a paying business until he was stopped. After homicide detail completed their investigation of the case and it was definitely determined that Dorothy Wagner took her own life, the matter was turned over to us. 11.50 a.m., we got off a request to Las Vegas asking them for all the information on the marriage. And then I contacted the stats office and asked them to make a run on the suspect for us based on his detailed description and also on his method of operation. I went back down the hall and met Ed Jacobs at the R&I counter. How you doing? Not too much luck, Joe. Forger didn't come up with anything either. Nothing on him in their files. I mean, it's not much of a start, is it? Apparently, this is the first time he's worked the town. Horns, we couldn't find anything on the name. Not in the main file, anyway. Mm -hmm. What do you got there? I asked John to check the correspondence file. He came up with this. Uh-huh. Out of Chicago, huh? Yeah, he came in over three months ago. Inquiry from their bunco detail. Suspect name right here. Frank L. Richland. Uh, same angle. Mary Dragon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the M.O.'s pretty close. Any description? Oh, well, here. What do you think? Six foot, 170 pounds, gray, wavy hair, blue eyes, fair complexion. Uh, that's fairly close. Could be. Mm-hmm. There's the alias list Richland uses, as long as your arm. Here's one caught our eye. Reynolds. Alias George A. Reynolds, Thomas R. Reynolds, alias C.H. Reynolds, alias Charles R. Reynolds. Mm. Wants on him for forgery, bunco, grand theft. A lot of experience. How about a mugshot on this one? Mm, none attached. No L.A. contacts either. Then well, we better get off a wire to Chicago PD, have them send us what they can on him. Oh. Want to prove it one way or the other by the end of the week, maybe, huh? Yeah. Copy his name down here. All uh right. -huh. Frank L. Richland. Correspondence number C143732. Chicago case number D-612-32. Attention, Lieutenant Smikles. I was just thinking, Ed. Huh? The last time anyone saw Reynolds, when was it? Ten, twelve days ago? Ten days ago, yeah. September 23rd, same day he cashed the check and took a run out. Well, if he's working the city for the first time, he must figure he's had some fair luck. Ten thousand on the first try, that's pretty encouraging. Yeah? If he gets the idea the town's a gold mine, he's not going to pull out stakes here. Mm hmm. 
figures. Probably trying to reach a couple other women with the same angle. Could be he's working on it now. Well, that's the problem. What do you mean? The women. Say he's been romancing three or four of them around town. He's got them all primed. Uh huh. How are you going to warn a woman about a thief before her purse is gone? After getting off a wire to Chicago regarding the suspect, which was in addition to the broadcast and the APB we'd gotten out on him, Ed Jacobs and I continued checking out the various contacts that he'd made in the city. We checked stores where he shopped, banks where he allegedly did business, restaurants and hotels which he reportedly patronized. It took three days of dull, steady legwork. You can say it much faster than you can do it. All of the bank references, without exception, were falsified. Where he made purchases, it was strictly cash dealing. The same for the restaurants he'd frequented. Besides meager descriptions of the man, the restaurant employees weren't able to help us much. At one of the two hotels, where we learned he was a guest for a full month, we finally netted half a lead. One of the bellboys told us that the man known as Charles Reynolds seemed to be pretty friendly with the head waiter in the hotel dining room, a Henry Kingsbury. We located Kingsbury in the dining room in mid-afternoon directing arrangements for a large private party to be held that night. Across the dance floor, the orchestra was on the bandstand rehearsing, the musicians in their shirt sleeves. Kingsbury was reserved, not too cooperative. Yes, I was acquainted with Mr. Reynolds, no more than the other guests, though. That's not the way we get it, Mr. Kingsbury. We hear you were pretty friendly with him. Only as far as my job goes, that's my business, making people feel at home, making them comfortable. We understand Reynolds was a pretty heavy tipper, is that right? He always took good care of me and the boys. The waiters were very generous. Did he expect anything special in return for the tips that he gave you? I don't think I understand. Oh, I think you do. How about it? Well, he was always very good to us, all of us. I could hardly refuse. Refuse what? When he first moved into the hotel, he became friendly with me, introduced himself, gave me a good tip in advance to take care of him. Mm. First few nights here, he spent at the cocktail bar, you know, meeting people, buying a few drinks, getting acquainted. Third or fourth night, uh, that's when he asked me. Yeah. He said when some prominent women came into the dining room, wealthy women, would I point them out to him? Single women, of course. Mm -hmm. I couldn't see any harm in it. He put a $20 bill on my hand. I said, yes, I would. After all, we have to look out for ourselves. Did he expect anything else for those tips? I don't know. I don't think it would be right if I told you. You know why we're here, Mr. Kingsbury. We leveled with you. We expect you to do the same with us. Well, there was the two Wagner sisters. They came here every Sunday night for dinner. Regular routine for them. Yeah. Mr. Reynolds is at the bar. He asked who they were, and I told him he seemed impressed. He asked me to help with an introduction to them, and I did. Next afternoon, he came to me again. He said he was taking one of the Wagner sisters to dinner that night. It was important to him. He gave me another big tip. Said he wanted us to roll out the red carpet for him that night. Mm -hmm. What'd that consist of? Well, special consideration, the best treatment in the house, you know. I was to act as if I'd known him for years. Well, it was a good tip. I did what he asked. As I say, well, we have to look out for ourselves. This happened more than once today? Two or three times, yeah. Miss Wagner, uh, Dorothy Wagner, she seemed impressed. At the time, I didn't think anything was wrong with it. You actually didn't know Reynolds, is that right? You'd never seen him before. Well, I suppose, yes. I only found out later, though, reading the papers. I mean, what really happened. I didn't know what he was at the time. You couldn't see what Reynolds was up to? You didn't know what he was doing? No, naturally not. He was a good tipper. That's all I know. It was the money. We have to look out for ourselves. Yeah. I felt sorry about Miss Wagner. I went to the funeral. They couldn't say I'm to blame, could they? What happened, I mean? It's not on my conscience. You wouldn't say so, would you? She's dead, mister. You figure it. Thursday, October 13th. The investigation continued. Still no sign of the suspect. We got an answer from Las Vegas and also from the Chicago PD's bunco detail on our inquiries. They enclosed mug shots and fingerprint classification of the suspect, Frank Richland, alias Charles R. Reynolds. The pictures were shown to witnesses and acquaintances who'd known the suspect, and they definitely established Frank Richland and Charles Reynolds as one and the same person. We got out a supplementary APB containing the latest information on the suspect. Saturday, October 15th, we got our second complaint on the marriage bunco artist, this time from the proprietress of a small chain of lunch counters in the San Pedro area, a Miss Hagar Lindstrom. Ed and I drove down to the harbor area where we interviewed her at one of her lunch counters. She identified Richland's mugshot. Her story of the marriage swindle matched closely with that of the previous victim, Dorothy Wagner. 
Ja, jeg var så fein gjentall, men Mr. Jan Rischler. I don't know what happened. I don't know what to say. He told you he was from England, Miss Lindstrom, is that right? Ja, yeah, he talked like English, but he could speak good English, like from London or someplace. Says he builds boats, big ones. I beg your pardon, ma'am. Big boats. Oh, yes. He told me that's his business. He said he had lots of money. We would sail around the world on a honeymoon. Maybe he will come back still. I hope so. I wouldn't count on that, Miss Lindstrom. Would you tell us this, please? How'd you happen to meet this man, Richland? At the hotel up the street. The big hotel. I can show it to you. The one on Jackson Street. Yes, ma'am. They seemed to know he was a rich man. Nice clothes he wore. He spent money a lot. When we got married, they spent lots of money. Where were you married, ma'am? We went down to Mexico. One weekend we went down there and we got married. It was romantic. Very nice. Even Lars liked it. Who's that, ma'am? Lars. That's him down the counter there. Lars, my brother. Oh, well, your brother went along with you when you got married, is that right? Lars and I go every place together. I don't do anything without Lars. Mr. Richland was nice about it. He didn't seem to mind Lars. Just a minute, they call him. Uh, Lars? Huh? Lars? Uh, Lars and I run the business together. Uh, the soda fountains we have. It's a long time we have worked at it. Hard work. Yes, ma'am, I guess so. We make good living, not easy, though. That's why it was so bad, Mr. Richland. Three thousand dollars he took. Oh, uh -huh. These are the police, Lars. They want to know about Mr. Richland. How do you do? How are you, sir? No, oh, he was no good. When they find him, they hit him. Now, the three thousand dollars he got from you, ma'am, how did that work? I mean, did you give him the money, lend it to him? Just what was it? When we came back from Mexico from being married, Mr. Richler and me and Lars, he said he was waiting for money from his bank in New York. Mr. Richland said that. He wrote me a check for three thousand dollars. I gave him our check for three thousand. Even Lars thought it was all right. Didn't you, Lars? Yeah, he was crazy. His check was no good. He beat him up, he punched him good. That's quite a bit of money, Miss Lindstrom. What kind of a story did he give you? He would buy the tickets for a honeymoon trip. That's what he said. A long trip together. Romantic. Mr. Richland and me and Lars. He didn't mind Lars coming along either. Did he, Lars? No, he didn't mind. Now, this Richland disappeared right after he cashed your check. Is uh, that yes, right? sir. He got the money and he was gone. Six days ago, we never hurt him. I don't know why he did this to us. I thought he loved me. I thought he was my husband. Mm -hmm. We haven't seen or heard anything of him since he disappeared? Not me nor Lars. But maybe we know. That's why we call you officers. Yes, ma'am. We have this friend, Antonia M. Svensson. He met Mr. Richland once when he was here. Mm -hmm. Svensson called Lars on the telephone. He said he saw Mr. Richland downtown going into the hotel. Are you sure it was Richland? Yeah, he said he thought so. How long ago did he see him? Uh, last night. We got on the phone right away and talked to the friend of the Lindstroms, James Swenson. He gave us the name and location of the downtown hotel where he thought he'd seen the suspect Richland the night before. Ed called the hotel and checked with the desk clerk. Yeah, that's right. Fairly tall, wavy gray hair, fair complexion. Might be registered as John Richland. Hmm? That's right. Okay, we'll check with you later. Bye. Any luck? Guy registered as Harold Richland. Descriptions match. He's still there. Checked out this morning. You are listening to Dragnet. Authentic stories of your police force in action. Compare Fatima with any other king-size cigarette. One. Fatima's length filters the smoke 85 millimeters for your protection. Two, Fatima's length cools the smoke for your protection. Three, Fatima's length gives you those extra puffs, 21% longer than standard cigarette size. And in Fatima, you get an extra mild and soothing smoke, plus the added protection of Fatima quality. To show our confidence in Fatima... We make this money-back guarantee to every king-size cigarette smoker. Buy a pack of Fatimas. Enjoy Fatima quality, extra mildness, and superbly blended tobaccos. If you're not convinced Fatima is better than the king-size cigarette you're now smoking, 
Just return the pack in the unsmoked Fatimas before August 1st, 1952, and we'll give you your money back plus postage. Fatima, Box 37, New York 1. Remember, each king-size Fatima gives you an extra mild and soothing smoke, plus the added protection of Fatima quality. Switch to Fatima today. Best of all, king-size cigarettes. Saturday, October 15th, 2.30 p.m. Ed Jacobs and I drove back downtown to the hotel where the bunco suspect, Richland, supposedly had been staying. The desk clerk definitely identified his mugshot and told us that the man registered as Harold Richland had checked out a few minutes before 9 a.m. that morning. No forwarding address. We examined the room he'd been staying in, talked to the residents and the employees of the hotel, but we failed to come up with a single lead as to the suspect's whereabouts. During the week that followed, we received three different kickbacks on the all points we'd gotten out on Richland. We checked each one of them out, but they failed to materialize into anything. We stayed on it. October 19th, Wednesday, 7.50 a.m. Morning. Hi. What's doing? Charlie Frost called from Forgery and went over to talk to him and came up with something on the Richland thing. Yeah, what's that? Picked up a woman last night, name of Helen Stokes. Got a good-sized record, checks, bunco records. Yeah. Got her this time on a check beef. She wrote one for $3,500. Yeah, well, how's it tie in with us? Check was made out to Harold Richland. 8.15 a.m. We signed out, drove over to the main jail, and had the forgery suspect, Helen Stokes, brought to one of the interrogation rooms. She was a dark-haired, fairly attractive woman in her early 30s. As a bunco artist, she apparently knew her trade pretty well. She was relaxed and talkative. She told us Richland had introduced himself to her at a Palm Springs resort the week before. When did the business of the check come up? As soon as we got back in town, he gave me the story. His money was in a New York bank. I played along with a gag. He wrote me a piece of wallpaper for $3,500. I did the same for him. What's the difference? Nobody hurt. Both checks, solid rubber. Maybe you forget, ma'am. There's a law against it. It's only a gag. I told you that. I would have loved to have seen his face when he found out the check was a phony. You don't think they're going to push the charge against me, do you? No, we've already told you, miss. You wrote a bad one. There's a law against it. I was only stringing him along. I knew his check was a phony, too. I didn't have anything to gain. Look, suppose I help you find him. Will you give me a hand on this? See, I get a break? We can't make any promises. You cooperate, help us find Richland, be taken into consideration. All right, you're on. You can tell lover boy I tipped you. You know where Richland is now? I can come close to it. How do you mean? I know where he'll be next week. On further questioning, Helen Stokes told us that on one occasion while she was at Palm Springs with Richland, she prowled his hotel room, went through his personal effects, and read his correspondence. She told us that she read one letter from a friend of Richland's inviting him for a visit the week of October 31st. She also noted Richland's answer accepting the invitation. She said the friend's name was Maurice Archer and that the letter came from an Ocean Boulevard address in the beach town of Venice. We went back to the office, ran Archer's name through R&I and found out that he had a previous criminal record of petty theft and grand theft. We located him at an Ocean Boulevard address and brought him in for interrogation. If there was any trouble, he wanted no part of it. After talking to him only a few minutes, he broke down and told us where we could find Richland, an address out near the end of Melrose Avenue. It was an apartment court. The suspect was registered in one of the rear cottages under the name of Reynolds. He wasn't at home. Ed and I went on stakeout inside the cottage. We waited. 6.30 p.m. Somebody coming in? Yeah. Hold it right there, Mr. Police Officers. What's this? Hands out in the open. Come on up. I don't understand this. Want to shake him down in? Yeah. All right, he's clean. Look, I don't know what you want, officers, but this is a mistake. Your name Charles Reynolds? Reynolds? No, my name is Richland. That'll do. Let's go. No, just a minute, please. What am I accused of? Who's accusing me? Last pigeon you had lined up. She wanted us to tell you. Helen Stokes. Stokes. Phony dame. You can't believe her, officer. She's phony. She's nothing but a con artist. That's a good reason to believe her. What? Takes one to know one. 7.05 p.m. After checking through the cottage, Ed and I drove Richland downtown and took him to the interrogation room. He'd admit nothing. We called Miss Wagner, the sister of his first victim, and she was still in town. She agreed to come down to the office to confront the suspect. So did the second victim, Hagar Lindstrom, and her brother, Lars. Cars were set out to pick them up. At a special show-up, Richland was picked out as the guilty man. We took him back to the interrogation room. 
Miss Wagner was the first one called in. She again identified Richland, alias Reynolds, as the man who had married and swindled her sister, Dorothy. All right, Miss Wagner, that'll be all. Thanks very much for coming in. Yes, all right. Thank you. Look, I don't know that woman. I'm not trying to be stubborn, but I'm afraid you're wrong. I'm not the man you want. Lindstrom's are outside, Joe, waiting. All right, bring him in. Miss Lindstrom, Mr. Lindstrom, come in, please. Miss Lindstrom? Mr. Lindstrom? Yeah, it's him. Yeah. I don't know you. I've never seen you before. You married me, John. You wanted to be my husband. You said that. Why did you want to hurt me? Sorry, I don't know her. You said for you and me and Lars to go on the boat, honeymoon around the world. You and me and Lars, you said all those things. Why did you want to hurt us? No, why? Is that enough for you? I don't know what they're talking about. They bait you up. Take it easy, Mr. Lester. Lars. Lies. He said we all go around the world, honeymoon. All right, all right. Get him out of here, huh? Okay, Mr. Lester. Thanks. It's no good, Lars. Come. Yeah. Chief. Out this way, please. Yeah, find him. He hit him. Thank you very much. There you are. All right. All right, Richard. You ready to give us a statement? All right, I'll tell you. You can't blame me for that one, though. You wouldn't have gone through with that deal yourself. Nobody would have. What's wrong? A nice-looking girl. Sure, I don't mean that. What do you mean? A big clown, her brother Lars. Yeah? How'd you like to take that along on a honeymoon? <laughs> The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On January 14th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 88, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, the reason Fatima can make the money-back guarantee you heard earlier can be summed up in two words. Fatima quality. Just prove Fatima quality yourself. Just compare Fatima with any other king-size cigarette. Fatima's length filters the smoke 85 millimeters, cools the smoke, all for your protection. You get those extra puffs because Fatima is 21% longer than standard cigarette size. And Fatima gives you an extra mild and soothing smoke, plus the added protection of Fatima quality. Prove it today. Buy Fatima. <laughs> Frank Richland was tried and convicted of two counts of grand theft and three counts of forgery of a fictitious name. After serving his term in the state penitentiary at San Quentin, California, he is to be released to Chicago authorities for prosecution. Grand theft is punishable by imprisonment for not less than one, nor more than ten years. Forgery of a fictitious name is punishable by imprisonment from two to fourteen years. <laughs> just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Heard tonight were Barney Phillips and Virginia Gregg. Script by Jim Moser. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all king-size cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. February 18th, hear the Gala City Service Silver Radio Jubilee on NBC. You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash C slash G-A-R. Brought to you by G3PL.com.
age 58, last seen in the vicinity of his home on Vernon Avenue. This man is wanted for questioning regarding the murder of his wife. That's all. It is obvious that the police of the most important cities and counties in the West would not be specifying Rio Grande cracked gasoline exclusively for police cars and other emergency equipment. Unless tests had conclusively proved that it was the fastest starting and most powerful gasoline that money could buy, as well as quickest on the getaway. You have all heard how Rio Grande's exclusive patented cracking process creates a gasoline that is recognized by petroleum experts as the very finest that can be produced. Now, listen to another refining advance perfected by Rio Grande. All cracked gasoline now goes through additional refining processes which extract all sluggish, slow-burning, lazy elements, leaving only concentrated energy. Now Rio Grande Cracks offers a finer gasoline than ever before, which means the finest gasoline money can buy, yet it costs you no more to enjoy this police car performance. pleasure to present Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. Chief Davis. Good evening, friends. The story you will hear tonight is an unusual one. In this case, the investigating officers were not faced with the usual type of killer, but with the man who, from all outside appearances, would be the last person in the world to suspect of murder. However, in this case, Appearances were deceiving, as was proved when link after link was forged in the chain of evidence against him. Until the final day when he broke down and confessed, the killer led the officers on a long, hard chase. But it proved again that although the criminal may elude capture for sometimes a week, sometimes a year, in the end, he is bound to be caught. It is a clear, sunshiny day in December in a small bungalow court on Vernon Street in the southeast section of Los Angeles. Mrs. Rose Apple is busy hanging out the washing when her next-door neighbor, Mrs. Alfred Wyatt, stops by on her way to work for a morning chat. Mm, good morning, Mrs. Apple. A uh, beautiful day for so close to Christmas, isn't it? It certainly is, Mrs. Wyatt. Now, when I think of the cold and storms that we used to have back home at this time of the year, oh, I'm mighty glad I'm living in California. Mm, that's the way my husband and I feel about it, too. But sometimes when it gets kind of cold in the early morning and I start to complain, Alfred would look at me kind of funny and say, How would you like to be back in Chicago right now where it's seven below? <laughs> that always makes me realize how little I really have to complain about. Yes, I guess that's right. Mm, here comes your husband. Morning, Mr. Happel. Good morning, Mrs. Wyatt. Well, I must be on my way, Mrs. Happel. See you tomorrow. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mrs. Wyatt. Well, Johnny? Now, don't go start my day off by nagging at me about work. I'm going out to look for a job as soon as I have some coffee. I, I wasn't going to mention that. I don't see where you get the idea that I'm always nagging you. Well, you are. I can't say much more of it. Is there any coffee on the fire? Well, I think there's some in the pot. We'll have to warm it up. All right. I'll be in just as soon as I finish hanging out these clothes. Uh, night nice household when a man has to do his own cooking. Uh, not enough coffee here. Yeah. Rose! Rose! What do you want? Where do you keep the coffee? There isn't any left in the pot. Oh, well, well wait a second. I'm also going to make you some more. Uh, you don't have to exert yourself. Just tell me where to find the coffee and... I'll make it myself. I don't mind making it for you, John. Can you sit down over there and read the paper, and I'll have some fixed in a minute. <laughs> yeah, it ain't funny you being nags about it. You must want something. John, what makes you so disagreeable? Are you feeling all right? Of course I'm feeling all right. Good as it can for you. Are you nagging me all the time? 
Oh, you talk nice in front of people, but I know what you're thinking. I can see by the way you look at me that you think I'm a lazy good for nothing. Well, maybe I am. All right, John. Don't get yourself all worked up over it. Read the paper or something until I finish making the coffee. Never mind the coffee. I don't want it now. I'm going out and see if I can find some work. Anything to get away from you. You've got me worried, John. Sometimes I think you're not sane. I'm not sane. That's the last call. That's the only thing you haven't said before. Yeah, I might have known you'd think of it sooner or later. I am sane. You're the one that's crazy. You're crazy as a woman. John, John, for heaven's sake, calm down. Your heart won't stand it. My heart won't stand it. I won't stand it. I'm sick and tired of your talk, talk, talk all the time. I won't stand it any longer. Tell you that. I'll think of something, some way to make you keep quiet. John, please don't go out in such a condition. You're liable to get into trouble. Trouble? You're the biggest trouble I have. I won't have you much longer. You wait. I won't have to listen to you much longer. Just you wait and see. John Happel spends the day looking for employment, nursing his self made rage, finding ways of thwarting his wife. And that night, he returns to the bungalow court, enters the house, walks into the bedroom where his wife was under. Is that you, John? Yes. It's me, Rose. You sound tired. Have any luck? I didn't get a job. That's what you mean by luck. Oh, well, maybe things will be better tomorrow. I look as though you could stand a good night's sleep. Rose, could you lend me a dollar? Tonight? Yeah, right now. Well, what in the world do you want a dollar for now? You're going to bed. I'm not going to bed. I only came home to ask you for a dollar. Well... Well, I haven't any money in the house tonight, John. Won't tomorrow be time enough? Tomorrow? Uh, I'm afraid tomorrow will be too late. What's the matter with you, John? What are you thinking about? Nothing that matters. At least, not to you. You're not going out again. I am. Uh, I'll be back in a minute. I just want to get something. Get something? For what? I'll show you in a minute. You know what I mean when I come back. Walking quietly into the night, John Happel goes directly to a small storeroom in the backyard. Fumbles in the dark with some object hanging on the wall. Finds it, re enters the house. As he opens the bedroom door, his wife's back is towards him. Slowly he raises his arm. The heavy iron bar held firmly in his right hand. Then, sensing his presence, his wife turns, sees him. December the 4th, Alfred Wyatt, the next-door neighbor, notices that the blinds in the Happel house are pulled shut, that the bungalow has an air of desertion. Finding the door unlocked, he enters, discovers blood on the walls of the bedroom, calls the police. Captain William Dave Bradley of the Newton Street Police Station sends Detectives Frank Prince and E.A. Teachers to investigate the Happel bungalow. The two officers are met the bungalow by Wyatt. It may not be anything at all, but well, I thought I ought to notify you. There's an awful lot of blood in there. You did the very thing, Mr. Wyatt. Is this the bungalow? Yes, this is the one. Right in here. I'd throw this door over here off to the bedroom. There. On the bed. And all over the wall. Holy Jupiter, fight. Look at that. Yeah, that's pretty sick. Mr. Wyatt, I don't think you've made any mistake in calling the police. This is the case for the homicide squad. Uh, you mean you think somebody's been murdered? That's right, Mr. Wyatt. Who lives here? Why, Mr. and Mrs. Happel. They, they've been here for some time. When did you see them last? Well, my wife talked to Mrs. Happel last Saturday. And, yes, she said she saw Mr. Happel Saturday, too. Yes, we'd better look around here and see if we can dig up. Right. Hey, hey if someone's been killed, where's the body? That's what we've got to find out. Did you look around the house after you discovered this? Oh, no, sir. I just called you. What's out back in that little chest? Oh, a bunch of old furniture and stuff. The Happels use it for the storeroom. Right, there's, a, there's a couple of trunks out there I noticed that I, I don't think were there last week. Maybe we better have a look out there. Come on, Ed. Right. You sure those trunks weren't there last week? Yeah, positive. I, I noticed them for the first thing when I got here today. Yeah. Let's have a look inside of them. Hey, 
heavy enough, must be filled with books. Maybe. How about the lock? Is it present? All three. Yep, lock tight. Guess we'll have to force it. Yeah. Use your screwdriver. That ought to do the trick. Now to lift the lid. <laughs> Bunch of old clothes. Yes. Put there on that coat. Lock. You better phone headquarters, Ed, and tell them to send out the more ambulance. Surprised by phone of the grizzly discovery, Captain Bradley immediately calls Chief Joe Taylor of the Los Angeles Detective Force, who in turn notifies Captain Bert Wallace of the homicide detail, and orders him to send Detective L.E. Sanderson and R.E.D. out to the death bungalow to assist in the investigation. This done, Captain Bradley, accompanied by Detective Collins, Johnson, Brody, and Conway, proceeds to the scene of the crime. Well, this is the place, all right, Collins. All these curiosity seekers have assembled already. Yeah. Hello, Captain Bradley. The trunk's around back. Good. I brought Tinker with me to look for Prince and Oliver and Davis to shoot some pictures. Let's go back then. Right. All right, you people. Come on, clear out of the way now. You wouldn't want to see it if we'd let you. Got any leads? Well, it looks like an open and shut case against her husband. The neighbors tell me he's an eccentric old bird who's always telling people how bad he was treated by her. Had a persecution complex or something. Hmm. Where is he now? Well, nobody knows. The fellow who called you saw him last. That was Saturday. He hasn't been seen around here since. Have you got a description of him? Yeah, I was just going to phone it in when you arrived. You better do that now and get it on the state teletype. If he did do it, he's probably out of town by now. I'll go around back and look things over while you call. Hello, Ed. What have we got? Plenty. Take a look. Hmm. Inspected the body in order to get it into the trunk, huh? Just that. We've got the instrument that it was done with. The small hand saw he found hanging in the clothes closet. Speaker's going over it for print. What do you know about this Apple fellow? Well, he's got a son living here in Los Angeles. Thought you'd probably want to go over and see him. I'll send two of the boys over to bring him in. I'm going back to the office. As soon as you boys get all you want from here, send the body over to the morgue and check with me. Right. Returning to his office, Captain Bradley settles down to the task of piecing together the little he knows about Happel. Then, shortly after nine o'clock, Detective Colling and Johnston, accompanied by Happel's son, Fred, walk into his office. Hello, boys. This is Fred Happel, Captain. How do you do, Mr. Happel? Sit down over here. What's the trouble, Captain? When did you answer your stepmother, Happel? My stepmother? You mean Rose? Yes, that's her name. Why, I guess it was the day before Thanksgiving. She came over to tell me that she and Dad were going to move back to their farm in St. James, Missouri. She had a small gas stove at her house and told me that I could have it if I come over and get it. Did you? Well, as a matter of fact, I was too busy. Didn't get around to it till last Saturday. Did you see her then? No. Dad was there, and he told me to see Dr. Lipson for the SERA. He helped me to load the stove in my car. Did your father seem nervous, upset? No more than he has been for the past year. He's been in pretty bad shape, mentally and physically, for some time. Have you any idea where he is now? Well, no, not the slightest. Say, he's in some kind of trouble, isn't he? I'm afraid he is. We'll talk about that later. Now the main thing is... We want you to tell us everything you can remember about the relationship between your stepmother and your father. How'd they get along? Well, not so well. Dad was always telling us how she mistreated him. Said that she had enough money to support both of them, but she wouldn't give him any. Mr. Happel, did you have any objections to our taking your fingerprints? Why, uh, nearly for comparison. Well, no. No, I wouldn't have any at all. Good. In the meantime, I want you to take a little trip with me. Shouldn't take more than 10 or 15 minutes. All right. Only I wish you'd tell me what this is all about. You'll know shortly. Come on down with me. I'll go into the morgue. Arriving at the city morgue, a few minutes later, Captain Bradley piloted young Apple down a long line of marble slabs. Finally stopping in front of one covered by a plain white sheet. Looking at the now pale young man, Bradley reaches down, lifts. Stepmother. Yes, that's Rose. Oh, my God, how horrible. Terrible. Identification of the mutilated body completes. The law begins the task of building its case against John Happel. 
Well, a barber, they learn. Sure, I haven't known John for a long time. Yeah, I've been out to see him for months. And on December 4th, he's coming to my shop. He's ordered a shave and a haircut. He says he's going up back east to buy a farm. And he's a paying me with a ten dollar bill. He's a comer from a road big enough to choke a cop. From the teller in the bank where Rose Happel kept a savings account. Why, yes. Mr. Happel came into the bank and presented the check for $491.30, signed by his wife. It closed out her savings account, but the signature looked genuine enough. I gave him the cash without a question. A close inspection of the check and comparison with others, signed by Rose Happel, establishes it as a forgery. In the little shack where the trunk was found, detectives discover the heavy iron bar used to murder the victim. Little by little, the facts forge a chain of evidence which points directly at John Happel. Without his whereabouts, no trace could be found. Then, on December 14th, two weeks after the murder, detectives take out of the death bungalow, take a letter addressed to Happel from the postman, and turn it over to Captain Bradley. It is signed by a person named Meyer and mentions certain business dealings. The letter is postmarked St. James, Missouri. Acting upon this clue, a wire is sent to the chief of police in St. Louis, requesting him to be on the lookout for Happel and giving him a complete description. And in St. Louis, the tollman, Emil Hopkins, reading the name in the police bulletin, recalls the fact that he knows a William Happel, John's brother, who lives in Maxwell, just outside of St. Louis. Suspecting that the wanted John Happel would get in touch with his brother, the tollman, Emil Hopkins, drives to Maxwell and for two days mingles with the inhabitants. Keeps his ears open for any bit of news of Happel. On the third day, his patience rewarded while he is ordering in the general store. He overhears a couple of farmers state that their old friend John Happel has just taken the bus for Arnold. Hopkins intercepts the bus, arrests Happel, and takes him to headquarters in St. Louis. And there, surrounded by several members of the St. Louis Police Department, John Happel amazes his audience with his calm, dispassionate account of the brutal murder. Anyway, that morning we had a fight, and she ran me out of the house with a broom. Kept hitting me on the back with it. Told me to get out and not come back till I had a job. What did you do then? Oh, I went out and thought it over. Then that night I came home, and as soon as I saw her, I decided I'd do what I'd said I'd do. So I got a piece of pipe. Where did you get the pipe? Out of the little shed in back where I kept a bunch of stuff. I used to sit out there and think in the daytime. It was the only place where I could get any peace. Anyway, I got the pipe. And when I walked in, she was sitting on the bed, taking off a stocking. So I just reached over and hit her on the head. Then what did you do? Well, I sat down and thought it over and decided I'd better put her somewhere. So I thought of the trunk I had in the house, and I dragged it in and put her in it. Didn't you feel badly about it? Killing Rose? No. She had it coming to her. If I had it to do over again, I wouldn't do any different. <laughs> she had it coming to her. Continuing in detail, the little thin man makes a complete confession and seems to be actually glad that he's going back to Los Angeles to face trial. Puzzled over his apparent desire to return to the authority, Chief McCarthy tries to question Hamill about it receives only the information that he's glad the suspense is over, and that he wants to get back to California where it's warm. So on December 22nd, Deputy George Storm of the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office arrives in St. Louis, completes the legal procedure of expedition, and starts the trip back to Los Angeles with Pample in custody. Three days later, on Christmas, two women, Mrs. Minna Kramer and Mrs. Elise Reinhardt of St. Louis, drive out to the small farm near St. James, where their brother, Henry Myers, lives in lonely solitude. Each out of bare existence on the wind swept promise. Arriving at the farm shortly before noon, the women sent a feeling of desertion about the ramshackle White House. That's funny. Henry should have heard the horn when I blew it on the back road there. He usually comes out to meet me. Maybe not well. I never did see how I could live out here all alone and not get sick. Oh, we'd better go in and see what's the matter. I feel queer inside of me. There's something wrong here. That's funny. I feel the same way. What is it? Here 
his drag. It's howling about something. Come on, Elise. Hurry. That howling's coming from around the back somewhere. Here's the path. Follow me. Henry. Henry. Where are you? Minna, that dog is out on the back porch. I'm going to look. I'll go with you. Can you see anything in here? February 
11, 1935, John Happel goes to trial before Superior Court Judge Charles W. Briggs, pleading not guilty by reason of insanity. But Doctors Edwin Waite and Benjamin Blank, after carefully reviewing the case and examining the accused man's mind, declare... I know the man undoubtedly has a twisted sense of proportions and a strange persecution complex. It is the belief of my associate, Dr. Blank, and myself, that Mr. Happel is not suffering from any form of insanity. And a few days after this damaging piece of testimony, few days after this damaging piece of testimony, Deputy District Attorney Salmon closes his summary with the words. There can be no doubt about it. This man, John Heppel, planned the murder of his wife carefully, knew exactly what he was going to do, and did it with willful intent to kill. He's a cunning, strange being, guilty beyond all doubt of first-degree murder. And on February 15th, 1935, John Heppel... The jury has found you to be guilty of murder in the first degree. Before this court passes judgment on you, and sentence, have you anything to say? She shouldn't have nagged that man. John Heppel, I sentence you to life in prison in San Quentin Penitentiary. Life in the pen? That's fine, Judge. Now I'll have three square meals a day, and nobody can nag at me. That suits me fine, Judge. For the full illustrated story about this unusual murder case, see the latest issue of the Calling All Cars News, which your neighborhood independent Rio Grande dealer will gladly give anyone absolutely free of charge. While you're in his station, we hope you will fill up your tank with Rio Grande cracked gasoline and see for yourself why it is specified for more police, fire, and emergency cars than any other brand. If you need oil, your Rio Grande dealer offers you the only 25-cent canned motor oil that's guaranteed to be free from wax and useless petroleum jelly. Sinclair Opaline Motor Oil. For only 25 cents per quart can, this oil is guaranteed to give perfect lubrication at the highest or lowest temperatures where other oils break down. It is a fact that you actually do get greatest value for your money from your Rio Grande dealer. Cracked gasoline and Sinclair motor oils have made Rio Grande the fastest growing oil company in the West because they are such outstandingly superior value. You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash c slash g-a-r, brought to you by g3pl.com. From the Longhorn Radio Network, adventure and mystery, classic series from radio's golden past. Secrets of Scotland Yard. How do you do? This is Ty Brook. You want to make some money? Do you in these days of austerity want those little luxuries that mean so much? You want to be the first to pay for a round of drinks? Give the barman a good tip as well? 
Or do you want to stand on the sidelines, unable to do a thing for want of cash? I think I know your answer. Well, if you really do want to make some money, you must procure some plaster of Paris, solder, tin, bismuth, pewter, and a jam jar. I'm afraid you must also have a little capital. It takes money to make money. Not much capital, say uh, half a dollar. You won't need anything else. Go ahead and make as much money as you need for the day. That's good, don't you think? Also, I feel that you couldn't strictly be asked to pay income tax. You could point out that you'd made the money yourself and that the mint had not been troubled. On the other hand, I must warn you that you stand a risk of being sent to prison for life. In the old days, the penalty was death. manufacturing shilling pieces in great number to be strangled unto death and then burnt at the stake. Here are ye, here are ye, here are ye. Yes, Barbara Spencer in 1721 was the first person ever executed for counterfeiting. By the way, perhaps you'll be surprised to hear there's hardly one counterfeiting case in police records in which a woman is not involved. Isn't that so, Inspector? That's right, Mr. Brooks. Women always seem to be chosen as agents for the coiners. Ah, yes. Agents. Perhaps I should explain to listeners that fake money usually goes through four stages in its criminal career. Firstly, it is coined by its maker. The coiner gives it to his agent or go-between. She, for it's generally a she, sells it to the buyer and he in turn employs a fourth person to pass the coin off as currency. Coiner, agent, buyer, and passer. In legal phraseology, the passer is the one who utters the counterfeit, uttering in this connection meaning to use as currency a forged or altered instrument or coin, knowing it to be forged. The passer very rarely knows who the coiner of the fake money is. With a respectable business as a front to his activities, the coiner carries on his criminal ventures in secret and well-hidden places and is not easily discovered. But he doesn't always escape the law. Now take the case of Thomas Craven, alias Cooper, alias Tom the Tailor, who carried on his trade in Bethnal Green, a suburb of London. In the same street, there was a tobacconist shop. It was here that something occurred one day that was eventually to put Tom the Tailor in prison. Good morning, sir. Oh, good morning. Uh, two ounces of green gem tobacco, please. Two ounces, sir? Here you are. Uh, thank you. How much is that? Three shillings, please, sir. Let's see. Uh, two, three... There you are. Uh, just a moment, sir. This is a bad sign. Is it really? <laughs> I say, you're quite right. I wonder who gave me that. Anyhow, uh, here's another. That, that's a good one. Yes, sir. Uh, that's a good one. Good day, sir. Good day. Freddy? Freddy? Yes, sir? Mind the shop a few minutes, will you? A bloke's just tried to pass off a dead coin on me for the second time this week. This time I'm going to follow him. And I'll tell the whole story to the first piece I see. Oh, no. Good luck, sir. I say, constable. Yes, sir. My name's Black. Uh, that's my tobacco in the shop across the way. Mm. You see that guy in the uh, grey suit looking in that window over there? Yes. There. See? He's been joined by a woman. Yes, yes. Well, twice this week he's tried to pass off a dud coin on me. I've been following him since he left my shop just now. Hmm, there are a lot of those floating about nowadays. Yes, but he used the same words each time. I think he's in the racket himself, and he knew it was a dud. Hmm. Well, you may be right. Where's the woman he's talking to? Well, I don't know, huh? Oh. Yeah. I see looking piece of good. He's just given him something. Hmm, we've had a uh, couple of charges before. Hmm. Wish I was in plain clothes. 
I'll keep after her. Let me know if anything happens, will you? Sure, yeah, right, Joel. The policeman followed the young lady. She went into Tom the tailor's shop. When she reappeared a few moments later, she went straight to the street corner and there met another man, to whom she again passed something. This time, the police constable waited no longer, but took her along to the police station. There, she was searched. Thirty fake florins were found to be sewn in the hem of her skirt. She was obviously the agent for some counterfeiter. But whom? The police constable, remembering that she'd visited Tom the tailor's shop just before her arrest, decided to give the old chap a call. Tom was a well-known character in the neighborhood and had established himself as likable and kindly. Oh, morning, Tom. Oh, good morning, officer. Just a moment. I'll, I'll ring for my assistant. Oh, you needn't do that, Tom. I only wanted a few words with you. Well, in case someone else comes in wanting to be served. Hmm. Tom, a young lady came in here about an hour ago, dressed in blue. Did you serve her? Young lady? Oh, yes, yes, of course. That'll be Miss Pritchard. She comes to ask whether her father's jacket was ready yet. The father's jacket? Yes, that's... Uh, uh, unfortunately, I hadn't finished the sleeve yet, but uh, why do you ask, officer? Oh, nothing, Tom. Just wanted to know what he was up to. I say, your assistant seems to be a long time answering your bell. <laughs> yes, he's a, a lazy scoundrel. Hmm. What about taking the ground, oh, Tom? Oh, all officer, not at all. You know the way down. Yes, all right, thanks. Don't let me disturb you. The suspicious police constable went down to the basement. But the scene that met his eyes was exactly what you'd expect to see in the basement of a tailor's shop. Long benches, yards of material, and several cutters at work with scissors and needles. But the constable wasn't satisfied, but he was sure there was something going on in the shop. He turned the matter over and over in his mind, until suddenly he jumped on what he knew must be the answer. The next day he paid another visit to Tom the tailor. Morning, Tom. Oh, good morning, officer. Uh, one moment, I'll... Oh, no, Tom, you won't ring. It's just what I want you to do. You don't mind, do you? Well, uh, why? I, I just want to ring for my assistant, officer, uh, in case some other customer comes in and uh, there's no one to serve. Are you positive that's the reason you want to ring, Tom? What other reason could there be, officer? That's just what I'm going to find out. If you'll stand aside and let me inspect your basement once more. Why, you... Now, now, Tom. No foul language, if you please. Let me pass, will you? Yeah. That's right. All right, you fellas. Don't throw anything on. You're caught red-handed. Draw me the police. I never heard the bell. No, you didn't hear the bell. I'm afraid I prevented old Tom from ringing it. He tricked me that way yesterday. Mm-hmm. What a setup you have down here. Furnishing board, plaster of Paris, silver solution, lamp black, battery racks. <laughs> One might almost think his gentlemen have been doing some coining. <laughs> all right, I suggest you all come quietly. I've right, three other men waiting for you outside, so up the stairs in quick time, please. <laughs> Tom the tailor's coining establishment was discovered, and old Tom was sent to penal servitude. Now it's time for us to examine more closely the methods of the counterfeiter, and there's no better place to do this than in that morgue of criminal instruments, the Black Museum of Scotland Yard. Mr. Brooks, one of the earliest counterfeit coins. Ha. It's astounding that anyone should be taken by that. Cut with a pair of scissors from a sheet of brass and silvered over, and passed over the shilling. The coiner's methods have certainly improved since those days. These coins in the next case, they are practically perfect. They are perfect. I know, don't tell me. They are pattern pieces. <laughs> a pattern piece. Hmm? In other words, a genuine piece of money from which the coiner takes his cast in plaster of Paris. So you see, you do have to have money to make money. 
And into that cart he pours whatever metal he uses. Solder, tin, bismuth, and of course, most of all, pewter. Yes, you may be surprised to know that the best foundation for a counterfeit coin is obtained from pewter beer mugs. In fact, whenever the theft of pewter pots is traced, it's ten to one that the thief is in league with the coiners. A certain publican in Whitechapel, London, will vouch for that. My name's Bill Carey. I run the Green Man Pub down in Whitechapel. It's a fine old place with plenty of tradition, if you know what I mean. Though there's one tradition we don't keep with anymore. The pewter pot cleaning competition. You see, in the old days, George, the potman at the King's Head pub across the way, used to come over to the Green Man once a year, and we used to see who could clean the largest number of pewter pots in an hour. <laughs> I remember our last contest. It was about ten years ago on a Sunday morning. Go on, Billy! Get on with it, George! You're as usual! anyway. Yes, I'll give him Bill. Bill's the winner again. That's two years running. Hooray! Lovely race, Bill. Thanks ever so for letting me come along. My, you two are certainly quick with your lads. Yeah. Yeah. Blimey, is that the right time? Oh, we can make the king's head. The boss will be furious. Oh, cheerio all. Bye, George. See you soon. We'll fix the date for the next contest. Yeah, rather. Cheerio. Well, we never did have any more contests. When the missus and me comes to count the pots that night, as we always did after a big day, we found there were a dozen missing. <laughs> that was bad enough. Well, what was even worse was the number of phony two shilling pieces and half crowns we took over the counter for weeks to come. And undoubtedly, most of them came from the pewter pots that Bill and Jimmy had raced to clean on the previous Sunday. The pewter would be melted, poured into the mold taken from the pattern piece, the two sides of the cast being kept together by clamps of hoop iron to secure a firm impression, filed, edged, and continually checked to get as near as possible the weight of a true coin. And then would come the most important process of all, silvering. The process of silvering coins is very similar to that of plating knives, spoons, and forks. Into the vat is dipped what is called a battery rack. Uh, there is some over here, sir. Ah, yes, it's rather good specimen. Simply a long piece of thick wire bent into a series of twists and turns in order to hold about a dozen coins at a time and made in such a way that no coin is touched by the wire in more than three places and all on the edge. These are well made. Whom did they belong to? Sidney Atway, sir, the master coiner of Fulham. Ah, yes, he did everything conscientiously. We might do far worse than study his methods, don't you think? We have a full case of his belongings over here. Yeah, good. Let's get acquainted with Mr. Sidney Atway, the conscientious coin. scientific coiners of modern times. He approached the whole subject in a most artistic fashion. Coining to him was more a hobby than a profession. And to it he devoted all the loving care that some give to stamp collecting, others to photography, others still to bird watching. His real business was the pawning of articles bought cheaply at sales and auctions. Only if the pawn broker offered a profit, of course. But he had many other interests as well, as we well know from his diaries and private papers. Went to a cookery lecture today. An attractive young lady gave us a complicated recipe for old English trifles. I stopped in the 
the dress book of all the English taverns in Paris. Following shops are those at which furniture may be had on hire. One, for a moving surplus hair from the back of the neck. Two, the right treatment for headaches. Three, the proper ingredients for making a highly satisfactory mustard plaster. And four, a certain cure for sluggish liver. But it was from a brooch pinned to the lapel of his wife's coat that gave Sidney Atway the idea to start the activities for which he is famous. It was coronation year in London, and Mrs. Atway had stopped on her way home from shopping to buy one of those souvenir brooches that everyone was wearing that year. Her husband, being an extremely mean gentleman, as most crooks are, was furious when he found that she'd been spending the housekeeping money on herself. Gilday, what's that you've got pinned to your coat? Oh, oh, Sidney, don't be angry. I couldn't resist it. It's one of the souvenirs they're selling in honor of the coronation. I thought it looked rather nice. Don't you like it? Let me see it. Oh, now look what you've done. Why can't you keep your temper? You've torn my coat. Oh, why couldn't you let me unpin the brooch? I'd have shown it to you. Two sixpences on a pin. Yes. Y you see, they're bright new sixpences minted this year. How much did you pay for this? One and sixpence. So, you see, it only cost me sixpence, really, because the coins always will be worth their money. Get downstairs, wasting my money on trash like this. If ever I catch you buying yourself things out of the housekeeping funds again, I'll take a stick to your back. Oh, oh, you're horrible. I, I, I don't know what I'm saying. Wrong oh, thing. One and six for two tanners on a pin. What a... Wait a bit, though. What a way to make a profit. A few bright sixpences. A drill can make the holes in a nice-looking safety pin. Or, why should there be real sixpences? Why not make my home? Sell them as souvenirs? Not claiming to them to be real money. Only one in ten suckers will ask whether it's genuine. And there's no trouble attached, as long as I don't pretend they're anything but I own make. Yeah. Yeah. Atway didn't stop at sixpences. He made shillings and half crowns and sold them as coronation souvenirs. When asked to pay three shillings for a half a crown medal, the purchaser would usually pass over the money saying, oh, well, I can always use the coin if I'm hard up. But if he ever tried to use it as currency, he would soon discover his error. Having now got interested in the coining business, Sidney Atway went about learning the methods thoroughly. Whenever he came up against a particular snag in the processing of the metal into coins, he would write to one of the daily papers. To the editor, Evening Herald, Fleet Street, London. Dear sir, have any of your readers any useful hints and suggestions as to the best way to make an electric battery? If so... Perhaps you would be good enough to publish their letters in your correspondence column. Editor, Daily Gazette, London. Dear sir, I hope you will publish this letter. I want to find out from any knowledgeable readers the simplest way to make solder from silver. There were generally numerous replies. Few people can resist the temptation to air whatever specialized knowledge they possess. And Sidney Atway's possessions in the Black Museum include a scrapbook full of newspaper articles and letters, all most helpful to him in his work. Of course, he bought the standard chemistry books as well and marked all the relevant passages. He evolved his own recipe for the silvering of coins. If any one of you are taking notes, I should perhaps mention that the process takes years of practice and many disappointments before it yields any reward. When the coins have been removed from the mold, I put them on battery racks of my own making and dip them into the vat. Coins made from Britannia metal, tin or pewter, are not dropped into acid before plating, but into a very strong and boiling, repeat, boiling hot solution of pure caustic potash. I then scratch the coins with a small brush made specially for this purpose 
and then plunge them straight into cyanide of silver solution at about 190 degrees Fahrenheit. An electric current from a battery is then run through the vat until the coins begin to receive a thin coating. Then I plate them in the ordinary way to give them a full amount of silvering required. And then on to the burnishing board. The burnishing board is a piece of wood on which the coins are set, being kept in place with pins and brushed over with an old scrubbing brush on which an ordinary lamp black has been applied. This process relieves the fake pieces of any undue brightness and consequently suspicion. Mr. Atbay used the seat of an ordinary wooden kitchen chair as his burnishing board. It's in the case in the Black Museum which contains his other paraphernalia. Seventeen bowls, one battery, two ladles, plaster of Paris, melting pot, plate of sand, brushes, drill, nine bottles of chemical, another battery made out of a three-pound jam jar, files, clamps, what else? Well, sir, there's some of the fake money that was found at his home when he was arrested. Two hundred half crowns, a hundred florins, a hundred and fifty shillings, and two hundred and six... Half the collection. He certainly was coining money. And that's not counting the fake currency he must have put into circulation during his 17 years' run as a successful auditor. A few more Sydney Atways and England would really be in danger of inflation. Yeah, a fascinating character. On his arrest, he turned to his captors with a disarming smile. Well, well, gentlemen, I hope you will tell the Royal Mint of my exploits. They should consider my career as a great compliment to themselves. After all, is not imitation the sincerest form of battery? Now examine the methods of making a counterfeit coin. What happens then? How does it get into your pocket or mine? When the coin is satisfied that he can get no nearer to the real thing, he wraps the coins in tissue paper, generally in parcels of a dozen, with a piece of paper between each coin to prevent jingling when they are being passed from hand to hand. The woman agent now takes the parcels and sells them to buyers either in public houses or in street corners. <laughs> More than a bit of a Charlie. Oh, no, sir. Could I buy you one, miss? I'll have the same, thanks very much. Thank you, too, Charlie. Oh, no. You're late. I was told to start. Oh, I was being followed. It had dodge you down a bit. Got the stuff? What would I be here for if I hadn't? The stuff has gone up, though. Why? With a profit, you'll make up two more than Thank you, sir. One and five from Oh, right, Take one now. Give me some change, will you? Right, sir. Where was it? Eight and seven, Jake. Thanks. You're real damn bad, Daddy, Jamie. Of course, you don't think I'd find any funny business here, do you? You were saying the price has gone up, what, two? Well, I've got three packets of off-round, that's in each. It'll cost you ten shillings. That's four pounds, ten shillings, half a quid. Oh, I suppose I'll have to buy it. I've got four pots creamy for more funds. Here, you are. it's ten bob. Keep them fine, eh? One, two, three, four, five. Oh, thanks, they're okay. Of course they are. I told you I wouldn't have a tiny funny business in here, didn't I? <laughs> oh, yes, you're so honest. What, well, now? And now the buyer will pass on the fake currency to his employees, who turn will pass it off on the shopkeepers and the general public. How? Well, there are several methods. For instance, a woman will go into a shoe shop carrying several parcels. She will pass some time selecting a suitable pair of shoes and then she'll prepare the ground passing something else. Oh dear, oh dear, I have so much to carry. Uh, could you deliver the shoes? Uh, certainly, madam, but what address? 12 Blakely Road, Mrs. Adams. Oh, and could your boy bring them in an hour's time? Otherwise, I shan't be there. Uh, very well, madam. The delivery boy turns up at 12 Blakely Road an hour later and is met by the woman just outside the gate. When she tells him that she is Mrs. Adams, he hands over the shoes to her and asks her to sign the receipt. Please. Janet Adams. There. How much do I owe you? Thirty-seven and sixpence, please, love. <laughs> Mr. Silver, I'm afraid. Oh, and there's another shilling for yourself. Now, oh, thank you, ma'am. Only when the delivery boy hands the money over his employer do they realize that he has been given five or six false half-crowns in the cash. And, of course, there is no Mrs. Adams living at the address. After all, it's admitted that we are not as careful as we should be about the money we handle. 
and the opportunities for a swindler to hush off his counterfeits must be extremely numerous. Perhaps you're one of those who make it a rule always to count your change. But how many times do you inspect each coin to make sure that it's a genuine article? Not very often. Sometimes there is no apparent cause to inspect your change, as in the following incident, which occurs in various shapes and forms about once a day in different parts of the country, generally in public houses and quite often in the cocktail bars of expensive West End hotels. substituted a few fake florins and shillings for the real ones. And that's coining for you. A woman gets a pair of shoes at a reduced price, a man gets a free drink and perhaps a bit over, and the coiner runs the risk of penal servitude for life. Is it worth it? Well, do you want to make some money? Oh, that's where we came in. By the way, the simplest and most effective way to detect a fake coin is to bite it. If it produces a gritty sensation on your teeth, it's not wartime food. It's a fraud. Or is that the same thing? Well, that's all for now, but I'll be back again soon to tell you some more of the secrets of Scotland Yard. Meanwhile, it's a book saying goodbye and check your change. You are listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash c slash g-a-r, brought to you by g3pl.com. This is Orson Welles, speaking from London. Here in the grim stone structure on the Thames, which houses Scotland Yard, is a warehouse full of souvenirs where everyday objects a skipping rope, a glass, an iron, a stepladder all are touched by murder. You take this key. This was on the floor beside the body, sir. A door key, the kind that fits only one lock. But whose? Perhaps the murderer's, sir. Today, this key can be seen in the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death. The Black Museum. In just a moment, you will hear The Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. Thank you. 
Now, the Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. Well, here we are in the Black Museum, Scotland Yard's Museum of Murder. Here lies death. Arranged neatly on the shelves and tables, open to your view. Now, here's a spoon. It's a simple household spoon. Our murderer was meticulous. With this, he measured out a careful dose of poison. That oar up there on the wall, that was used by the stroke of a famous rowing aid at Henley. Later, it was used in anger, swung at a man who stood on the edge of a pier, stunning him. The man drowned in the Thames very quickly. Ah, here we are. Here's the key. An ordinary key. The kind used to open most of the front doors in London. Once this key was in the pocket of a man who was waiting for another in his room at the Kingsley Arms Hotel in Surrey. Regan? Oh, I, I'm sorry. Excuse me, sir. I'll, I'll just turn the bed down. Uh, certainly. I'm waiting for Mr. Regan. You don't happen to know what time he'll be back, do you? No, sir, but if you wait here, you're sure to catch him. Thanks, I will. I particularly want to see him. The conversation lapsed. The visitor sat down again. The maid completed her work and left, stealing a glance at the young man as she closed the door behind her. Night fell. Lights came on in the guest bedrooms. But in one room, the number on the door was 22. A man sat alone in the darkness, waiting. The night passed, and morning came. In the hotel, there were beds to be made, rooms to tidy. No answer from room 22. The maid was pleased her work could be accomplished without interruption. She was thinking of this as she opened the door. Stepped in, the bed was unused, turned down just as she'd left it. Sunlight was flooding through the two windows, and on the floor, a man lay dead. The manager called the police. The police requested the assistance of Scotland Yard. And Inspector Sidney Russell and Detective Sergeant Hobbs were sent down to Surrey. This is the room, sir. Number 22. Has anyone been in there since the maid found the body? No one, Inspector, except myself and the local police sergeant. On his orders, I kept the room locked. Good, ma'am. There you are. Thank you. I'll let you know when we need you, sir. The two detectives covered the room, and in their quick survey of the murder scene, they found several leads. His wallet, sir. Let's have a look at the identity card, Sergeant. There you are, sir. Hmm. Name's Thomas Regan. What else have you got there, Sergeant? Uh, roll a note, sir. The killer either missed that or the motive wasn't robbery. Oh, I don't think it was robbery, sir. His watch is still on his wrist. Going? No, sir. It stopped at 7.25. That might have been the time the murder took place, though on the other hand, the watch might have run down this morning. He was shot through the head, sir. Surely somebody must have heard that. You would think so. Well, here's a shell I found on the carpet. Hmm. Point 22. We'll keep this for ballistics. What else, Sergeant? Oh, some silver taken from his trouser pocket, a handkerchief with the initials, initials T.R. in the corner, and a cigarette lighter. With the initials T.R. Hmm. He's well labeled. And uh, this was on the floor beside the body, sir. The door key, the kind that fits only one lock. But whose? Perhaps the murderer, sir? Unless it belonged to Regan himself. Oh, it's not the kind they use in hotels. No. Was he wearing or carrying a keychain? No, sir. Then the key would have been carried in his pocket along with his money. Which hadn't been spilled onto the floor. You may be right, Sergeant, but to make absolutely sure, that key should be checked against every lock in Regan's home and his office and everywhere he might have occasion to visit. If it does not belong in any of those places, then it seems to me that when we find the door that key fits, we find the murderer. The detectives went downstairs to talk once more to the hotel manager. 
Inspector, this is a terrible business. Listen to those men in the bar. What about them? They're newspaper reporters. Oh, this is really dreadful. The notoriety, the reporters, the headlines. It'll ruin my business. It wasn't very nice for Mr. Regan, either. No, I, I suppose not, poor devil. What can you tell us about him? Only that he was a commercial traveller. He'd stayed here before? Oh, several times. A traveller, eh? Did he work for any firm in particular, would you happen to know? Yes, I do know, because they always paid the hotel bills. He worked for a London firm, Hardy and Sons Limited. Thank you, sir. Now I'll leave the room upstairs locked until we have it photographed and checked for fingerprints. Oh, Inspector, there's one other thing I'd better mention. I think it's important. Yes? A man called to see Mr. Regan last night. Did you get a good look at him? I didn't see him at all, nor did the desk clerk. The maid found him waiting in room 22 when she came in to turn the bed down. Unusual, isn't it? Knowing Regan's room number? It suggests an acquaintance. Not necessarily, Inspector. Why do you say that? We have a register here in the foyer. It's on that wall over there. A room register? Yes, just a card opposite the room number. Some people don't bother with it, but Mr. Regan always put his card up. So that made us the only one who saw this man? Yes, Inspector. Then I'd like to talk to her, sir. Oh, I'll go and get her for you. The hotel manager returned almost immediately with the maid. She was a young girl, very pale, her eyes still fearful from the sight she'd seen on the floor of room 22. Annie Mitchell, Inspector. How do you do, Annie? Uh, this is Inspector Russell from Scotland Yard. How do you do, sir? Annie, what time did you turn down the bed in room 22 last night? It was going on for six, sir. And I believe Mr. Regan was not in his room. No, sir, but there was a man there. Could you describe him to me? Well... He was tall, fairly young-looking, and dark hair. He spoke uh, educated-like. I see. What did he say? Just that he was waiting for Mr. Regan, and he particularly wanted to see him. Tell me, would you know this man if you saw him again? Well, yes, I think I would. The inspector was well satisfied, but Sergeant Hobbs, who had been questioning the guests, had not fared so well. Uh, now, sir, I'm sorry to trouble you, but I have to ask you a few questions. Uh, really, this is most annoying. I've been kept here all the morning, and it's extremely inconvenient. I quite understand, sir. Now, uh, can you tell me whether you heard any unusual noise or disturbance during the night? The only disturbance of which I'm aware is the disturbance created by the police this morning. You uh, didn't hear a shot, for instance? Certainly not. And you were in your room the whole evening? Yes. Can I go now? Yes, that'll be all. Uh, thank you very much. Well, it's certainly... Certainly not been a pleasure. It seems nobody heard a shot last night, sir. Nobody at all. Not a single guest, even those occupying adjoining rooms. That's funny. Anyway, I'm leaving you in charge here. The police right, surgeon sir. will be arriving to carry out a post-mortem. All right, sir. Are you going back to London? Yes, I think the case winds up there. The next move is to London to check that key against every lock in Mr. Regan's home and his office just to see if it fits. I'm uh, very sorry to bother you, ma'am, but I'd like to go right over the house, if you don't mind, trying the locks and... Uh, if there are any cases or cupboards, etc., that I might miss, I'd be very pleased if you'd point them out to me. I'll uh, come along to see if you can help me, sir, in connection with Mr. Regan. I want to know if there's any desk or a cupboard in his office, uh, or the office door itself, which has a lock for which this might be the key. <laughs> I believe you've uh, a lock-up garage here, formerly rented by Mr. Regan. It must, of course, have a lock, and I'll be glad if you'd allow me to compare the lock with this. No, sir. I've checked every conceivable place connected with Regan, and the answer the same everywhere. The key does not belong. Mm -hmm. In that case, we have our answer. Somewhere, someplace, Sergeant, there is a door, and behind that door we'll find the murderer. You know, if I was a philosopher, I would say that it's rather symbolic that we have a key to which we must fit the lock. Still, I'm not a philosopher, I'm a detective, and it's our job, Sergeant, to find the lock, to find the door, and to find the murderer. And that's just what we're going to do, Sergeant. We're going to find the door that this key fits. In time, they were to find the door... 
By patient, methodical methods, they came to the front door of a small flat. The key fitted. The same key that can be seen today in the Black Museum. In just a moment, we will continue with the Black Museum starring Orson Welles. continue with The Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. Inspector Russell went back to London, certain that the crime had motive, and that the motive would only be found by a search into the habits and associations of Thomas Regan. His first call was to the offices of Hardy and Sons Limited, where he was speedily ushered into the presence of the reigning Mr. Hardy. Come in, Inspector. Sit down. Thank you, sir. Shocking business. Now, who could have wanted to kill poor Regan? That's what we're trying to find out. Of course. Shocking. One of our best travelers. What do you know of his personal life, Mr. Hardy? I may be able to help you there, Inspector. I believe in taking an interest in my employees. I've uh, always encouraged them to bring their troubles to me. And Regan had troubles? Yes. He was a bachelor. Rather a gay one at times. I suspect he, uh, he was having trouble over a woman. Yes? A married woman. She kept on ringing up to speak to him, and the thing spread in the office. He was rather embarrassed and slightly worried about it all. Do you happen to know the woman's name, Mr. Hardy? I'm afraid I can't help you there, Inspector. Though, uh, wait a minute. Yes? He did mention something. That's right. I've got it now. Uh, he didn't want to tell me her name. That's a pity. But in admitting she was married, he did tell me that her husband was a doctor on hospital duty. A doctor? Yes, and uh, one other thing I recollect. He mentioned her first name. It was Lindell. And I have information that the man we want to interview is young. That suggests a hospital in turn. Yes, with a wife named Lindell. Hmm. Not very much to go on, Inspector. Well, it might be quite a help. He never told you, I suppose, whether it was a London hospital or not? He never said so, but I'm quite sure it would be. At least the wife lives in London. What makes you think that? Well, the number of telephone calls that woman made to Regan. Nobody could afford that many trunk line calls. So they began in London, St. Bartholomew's Hospital. An intern or a young doctor whose wife's name is Lindon. The registrars of the big hospitals consulted their records, made special inquiries. St. Thomas's, Westminster, Guy's. Each one of them returned to shake his head. There are several hundred hospitals in the London area. Big general hospitals, small private nursing homes, special hospitals, children's hospitals, maternity infectious orthopedic hospitals. At the first 42, they drew a blank. Then, at the London Royal Hospital at last. A young intern whose wife's name's Lindell. That's a funny one, Inspector. It's all the information we have, Doctor. It's useless to ask, I suppose, whether you might have this man on your staff. But we do have him. What? Well, at any rate, one of our interns has a wife named Lindell, uh, Dr. Bowen. Dr. Felix Bowen. I'll send for him, shall I? No, wait, Doctor. Could you give me some idea what this Dr. Bowen looks like? Yes, I think so. He's, 
He's young, 31, I, I think, uh, quite tall, uh, dark hair. Would you have his address here in your records, Doctor? Certainly. I, I'll get it for you, Inspector. Thank you. And shall I send for Dr. Bowen? No, I don't want to see him just now, and I don't want it known that any inquiries have been made about him. Uh, very well, you can depend on me. Is he in some kind of trouble? Nothing to worry about just yet, sir. Now, if you'll get me that address... Patients had paid off the 43rd Hospital. Now, to interview Lyndall Bowen. Inspector Russell went to the address he'd been given a small flat in a good residential district. The lock on the door fascinated him. The urge to try out the key in his pocket was almost overwhelming. But instead, he knocked. Mrs. Byrne? Yes? I'm Inspector Russell from Scotland Yard. Scotland Yard? May I come in? Yes, of course. Thank you. She was young, an attractive woman, but her eyes were frightened. Mrs. Byrne, when did you last see Thomas Regan? Regan? Tom Thomas Regan? I think you know who I mean. But I don't, Inspector. I'm very sorry. Not at all, ma'am. Perhaps I'm mistaken. Well, of course, I've read about him in the papers. That is, if it's the same, Mr. Regan. It is the same. Mrs. Byrne, with your permission, I'd like to conduct a small experiment. Experiment? I, I don't understand, Inspector. It's quite simple. This key. Key? I'd like to try it in your front door. But I... Of course, if you choose to say no, then I won't be able to try it. You won't? But, but I, I also ought to warn you that I can return in a very short time with a warrant. All right. Try it. Thank you, Mrs. Byrne. I'll just open the door and insert the key... <laughs> the key turned, effortlessly and easily. Hope died in the woman's eyes. The inspector from the yard took out the key and closed the door again. And now, Mrs. Byrne, you and I are going to have a talk about Thomas Regan. That afternoon, several significant events took place. A gun was found beneath a pile of medical books. It was taken to Scotland Yard to the ballistics expert there. The gun checks up. That's the murder weapon, right enough. Little wonder nobody heard the shot in the hotel. It's fitted with a silencer. A silencer. Evidence of premeditation. Late that afternoon, the record of its purchase was uncovered. The second significant event. The gun was bought at a shop in the Soho district, sir. A second-hand shop two weeks ago. By whom, Sergeant? The description covers Dr. Felix Bowen. And the proprietor says he could recognize the man if he saw him again. We'll give him that chance. Come on. Where to, sir? The hospital. To pick up Bowen. The third event was Bowen's flight across London. Somehow, in some way, the doctor learned of the net that was closing about him and made a run for it. He was gone when the detectives reached the London Royal Hospital. They drove to his home, but he wasn't there. Now across England, the vast network of police communications went into action. The teletype carried the news of the fugitive. Central to all stations. General alarm for one Dr. Felix Byrne, aged by 31, six feet tall, dark hair. Educated voice, quietly spoken, wanted on suspicion of murder. The search was on. In a thousand stations, vigilant eyes searched for Bowen. On the streets, on trains and buses, in restaurants and hotels. Within 24 hours, he was picked up. I, I really must insist. This is a terrible mistake. I really don't know what, what this is about. Uh, and I'm sure you've got nothing to worry about, sir. Uh, just answer a few questions, that's all. Well, of course, I'm perfectly prepared to cooperate with the law. But I must insist on an explanation at once. Yes, yes, of course, sir. You see, unfortunately, your appearance coincides with the description of a man wanted by the police. It's oh? uh, just a routine matter, sir. Uh, if you'll give me some proof of your identity, we can clear the matter up in a few minutes. But I explained to the constable. It, it's no longer compulsory to carry an identity card. Yes, I know that, sir. But before we release you, we must have proof of your identity. Yes, but how can I... Uh, you see, sir, we must be sure you're not the wanted man. But I told you already... Uh, now, Mr. Bowen. Yes? Yes, Dr. Bowen. Uh, 
Inspector Russell? This is Sergeant Thompson, sir. Hi, it. We've picked up a man who we believe is Dr. Felix Bowen. Hold him, Thompson. I'll be there in a matter of minutes. It was Bowen right enough. But if Inspector Russell hoped for an easy confession, he was disappointed. The doctor was defiant and tight-lipped. I know nothing, I tell you. Nothing whatever. This whole thing is an outrage. I must remind you, sir, that your wife has made certain admissions. My wife? What has she told you? That she and Regan were having a love affair. That you found out. And the day before last, you went down to Surrey to see Regan. You returned late that night. Did I? And under a pile of medical books in your bookcase, we found the gun you used. The game's up, Bowen. The game is never up, Inspector. Until it's lost. The evidence they had accumulated was impressive. But juries are cautious, and defense counsels are often very smart. There had to be no loopholes. There had to be complete corroborating evidence. I think we've got our man all right. The next thing is to prove it beyond all shadow of doubt. What's the uh, next move then, sir? Well, Sergeant, there's one person who got more than a passing glimpse of the murderer. Oh, you mean Annie, the maid at the hotel? Right. We'll see how Mr. Byrne fares on our identification parade. I have a feeling he won't fare too well. Now, Annie, I expect you've heard of an identification parade. Yes, sir. Like they have on the films. That's right, Annie, but this is not a film. This is the real thing. Before we go into the next room, I want to impress on you how important it is that you make no mistake. A man's life may depend on your judgment. So when you answer me, make sure, absolutely sure, beyond any shadow of doubt, the man you identify is the man you saw on the night of the murder. Yes, sir. Right, then. Now, in the next room, there are eight men. I want you to follow me into the room, take a good look at each of them, and see if you can pick out from amongst them the man you saw in room 22 waiting for Mr. Regan. Very well, sir. It's not the first gentleman. Nor the second. But... This is the man, sir. That's a lie. Yes, and that's his voice. I'd know it anywhere. This is the man, Inspector. Well, Mr. Byrne, would you like to make a statement to us now? I have nothing to say, except that I doubt that the evidence of a silly maid is likely to give you a conviction, Inspector, whatever you may think. We're depending on more than that, Mr. Byrne. There are other witnesses, including a silent witness, a door key. That was careless of you, Mr. Byrne. Very careless indeed. Byrne was identified also by the owner of the second-hand shop as being the man who had bought the gun some two weeks before. With that, the case was complete. A door key had helped to find a murderer. And that self-same key can be seen today in the Black Museum. <laughs> Orson Welles will be back with you in just a moment. Now here in person is Orson Welles. Bowen killed the man who had stolen the affections of his wife. 
His was not a clever crime. It was premeditated, without a doubt, but clumsily conceived. For the young doctor was no student of the art of murder. Yet he might have escaped justice had not a key fallen from his pocket, a key which ultimately brought the police to his front door. And now, until we meet next time in the same place, and I tell you another story about the Black Museum, I remain, as always, obediently yours. The Black Museum, starring Austin Wells, is presented by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Radio Attractions. The program is written by Creswick Jenkinson, with music composed and conducted by Sidney Torch. Produced by Harry Allen Towers. have been listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash C slash G-A-R, brought to you by G3PL.com. Don't forget to subscribe for more videos. I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to Old Time Radio Research Group for their remarkable efforts in preserving and archiving the captivating world of old time radio programs. Their dedication to safeguarding these precious audio gems ensures that future generations can relish the enchanting stories, music, and entertainment of the past. Their invaluable contribution allows us to step back in time and experience the magic of radio history firsthand. Their link is in the description below.